actually another one loads of people want to talk about electric cars so we're going to talk about that tomorrow China's well. influence possibly yeah. but also even if, if China aren't going to stop them I mean just the, the nature of electric cars are they fit for purpose are they actually working are they how do we fill them pets? up uh, well, uh, exactly there's loads there's loads to think about there so we're going to be talking about that on the show as well today super super I hope it goes really well Peter really thank nice you, to thank see you. you and I was joking about Renee she's lovely <laughs> No, she isn't. Um, <laughs> so good to have you back yesterday. What a treat for cheering us up with Dr. Rene and Dr. Raj. Uh, have a very happy Saturday. That is from Louise. Thank you, Dr. Thank Rene. You. Are you coming back tomorrow? Yeah? Lovely. See you tomorrow. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, 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 treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh. Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. A very good morning to you. I'm Peter Cardwell here with uh, Talk, and we will be chatting between now and one o'clock about all sorts of issues. But of course, there is one news story dominating the agenda today, and that is Princess Kate revealing that she has uh, been undergoing treatment for cancer, putting to an end a lot of the speculation that has been going on. And of course, that's been going on online, and so on. A lot of people saying actually those trolls should stop, and the media should stop as well. Do we have a role in this as well? and should the, the speculation stop? Of course it should now because we know what has happened, but just in general in terms of how we treat the royal family, what should we do? I'm going to read you a quote actually from, believe it or not, Nick Robinson, the BBC Today programme presenter. He had cancer, I think, on his throat. And he said, deciding when, how and what to tell those you love and who love you about a cancer diagnosis can be as traumatic as hearing about it for the first time yourself. I hope those who casually spread gossip, rumour and conspiracy theories about the Princess of Wales now stop and think about what they're doing and tell others to do the same. What do you think about all of that and how are you reacting to the news today? Of course, there are so many people who have cancer and so many people who have the same kind of dilemmas as Princess Kate has in terms of telling her children and in terms of telling friends and family. Let us know what you think. 0344 499 1000. You can text me at 7222 with the word talk in your text. And you can also tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. You can WhatsApp as well. You can actually WhatsApp a voice message and we can play it out on the air if you want to do a little sort of 30 second voice message about your uh, views on this. 0344 499 1000 is the number as well. Uh, we also want to talk today about potholes. They are getting worse. We know that this is a serious issue right up and down the country. So uh, what can be done about it? What should be done about it? And actually, when lots of political parties talk about what they want to do after the next election, surely the very basics, filling in potholes, getting uh, places in local schools, dealing with hospital places, for example, that's waiting lists. That's something that they should all be doing, of course. Let us know your thoughts on what the political party should be doing and whether you have potholes that haven't been filled in for weeks, months, perhaps even years. 0344 499 1000. We're talking about electric cars as well. I had a debate yesterday and a viewer contacted me about it and said that just wasn't long enough. And do you know what? I respond because this is my show, but it's your show too. And if you suggest things, if you want to talk about things, if there are things that we didn't even think were on the agenda a couple of weeks ago, we talked for ages about mobile phones being stolen, for example. You just let me know. 0344 499 1000. Lots to talk about between now and one here on Talk TV. Well, it was an incredibly uh, moving moment yesterday. I was in the street, actually, and I stopped in the street and watched the video of Princess Kate Catherine, uh, of course, as she's known to William, Princess Kate, Kate Middleton, however you want to talk about her, the Princess of Wales, who has been subject to such cruelty, online speculation. We were joking, of course, about things like the Brazilian bum lift and all the kind of ludicrous conspiracy theories that have been out there. Well, actually, what she said was true. She had surgery for abdominal uh, problems, and that then revealed that there may well be cancerous cells. She's having preventative chemotherapy, and that is ongoing at the moment. A tremendously dignified video. We're going to watch it a little bit later in the program, but I want to get reaction. Actually, let's watch it now. Let's see what Princess Kate had to say yesterday. Perhaps you've missed this, so let's have a watch and a listen. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful, However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. 
As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. The Princess of Wales in a sometimes emotional statement that was released last night at six o'clock confirming that she has uh, ha going, un undergoing treatment for cancer, having chemotherapy to preventative treatment that often happens after suspected cells are found. We're going to get the full medical uh, look at this a little bit later on with an oncologist with a cancer doctor. Lots of people getting in touch with this already. What do you think? 0344 499 1000. I want to get as many calls, texts and tweets about this as possible. And Jackie's been in touch. So, morning Peter. Kate has asked for time, space and privacy. I wrote that down actually when I was listening to that again. The way we respect that is to stop discussing it. There's been enough media coverage since the release of her video, so it's time now to wish her well and respect her wishes. Jackie, this is a massive news story and I think we do need to discuss it and actually maybe we need to take a little look at ourselves as a society, as people who post things online, perhaps even as journalists, as, as the media in terms of how we treated this. Marion County Down has been in touch to say the way she's been treated vindicates Harry and Meghan's stance on media and their very wise decision to quit the royal circus. What do you think of that? That's a provocative one, very interesting one in regard to Harry and Meghan. 0344-499-1000. Thank you to um, uh, someone else's uh, message here. I don't think this is, a, I, I'm not sure I agree with this to be honest. Peter says, how long before Harry announces that his wife is suffering from or has recovered from a life-threatening disease? I think that's too cynical, I'm afraid, and, and to be honest, a little bit tasteless, actually. But listen, I want to reflect your views on all of this. Judith De Silva is a royal commentator and is with me now. Judith, um, how much of a shock was this? Thank you for joining me today, because there was so much speculation and uh, there was a lot of unfairness, really, uh, but also people saying, well, the royals gave us some information about what uh, was wrong with Kate, but not the whole picture. And actually, when it comes to being frank with people, previously we didn't know really anything about the Royals' health, and now we're given a bit of detail, but now we've been given really all the detail. What do you make of this, Judith? Um, I think it's, first of all, it's like the actual diagnosis of um, being treat treated for pre preventative treatment for cancer is shocking because that's possibly the worst news that she could we could have had with the explanation for what's happened thus far. But then, uh, well, because I was uh, during the whole furore, I was out in America and I was speaking to journalists there and all of them were saying, what's going on with Kate? What's going on with Kate? And I always would say, as journalists, our job is to deal with facts, not speculation. Look at what you have in front of you and what has happened thus far. King Charles was very forthright with his diagnosis and what was happening with his treatment. There was, and they say nature abhors a vacuum, but there was a vacuum around the diffusion, the dissemination of information around Kate. That indicates one, it's something serious, and two, something they don't completely have a hold on. So they can't give us information that will be accurate or factual, so give them nothing. Then you had this wave of speculation, people's mis misinformation that kept happening and swelling, and we all know that the firm operates a press office that deals with controlling and curating the narrative around the royal family. Still, there was a vacuum of information. That was for further evidence. But that is it any of our business? Ju Judita, sorry, it's Judita rather than Judith. Apologies, I got that wrong. Um, right. do, is it any of our business actually to know uh, what, what, she's, what she's suffering from? I mean, we've been told, for example, the king has cancer, but we haven't been told what type of cancer it is. Have we any right to know that? 
we have no right to it but unfortunately when you're public figures you are subject to the tone of the day and in modern times we live in the social media era which has forced which has kind of steered society to a place where they feel because i have so much access i almost feel like i have entitlement so you're fighting this hydra that keeps mutating as technology keeps evolving and in order to survive you've got to adapt they when simply put they have they don't owe us anything they don't have to but the way you operate is as a public figure and public figure requires information and a narrative that you're is saying, curated Judina, to represent what is going on judita sorry to interrupt you but you're saying they don't owe us anything i mean some people will say, I, I think I, I basically agree with you, but to play devil's advocate in that, some people will say, well, actually, hold on, they are the royal family. They are the uh, constitutional, well, Charles anyway, is the constitutional head of this country. William will be king, Kate will be queen, and I'm sure they'll do a really good job. But they are public figures. They are constitutionally important. So maybe we do have actually some right to information there. There's a clear difference. They owe us public service. They do not owe us personal private information. Those are two very separate things. But unfortunately, we live in a time where the lines are so completely blurred. Once you're a public pe figure, people assume you owe us every part of you. And that isn't right. That's a and really good point, Julia. That's a really good point. And I think this is a wonderful le learning moment because all those who speculated in a negative way, in a cynical way, in a derogatory way, you have to take a moment, take a beat to think what this, this is before they're royals, they're a family. Mm -hmm. And not just any family, family with young children. When you think of all, whatever experience you've had, be it personal or close to people with cancer, normally in families when children are very young, you know they don't have the capacity to understand the gravity of it. And a lot of parents choose not to tell the children and they navigate their way through it. Unfortunately, Kate is backed into a corner where the public will find out and you don't want a situation where the children find out secondhand. So that's why she probably made that comment about it's taken time especially with Louis, who's the youngest, mm. to get them to understand what's going on because now they have to deal with what's happening in the family and how the public is reacting to it as well because they're public figures. You're absolutely right. And those children are very young. Um, and, of course, that they will be familiar with the fact that they're public figures already. They know that. They'll have seen pictures of themselves in the paper and on television and so on, even if they don't fully understand what the future holds for them. But explaining this to children, explaining such a serious condition and you know you don't want to scare children but of course it is a very very serious issue we'll be talking to someone a little bit later on about this to have to explain to her children that her husband had cancer um, and later died unfortunately um, but I just want to ask your opinion Judita in terms of the children themselves because they are growing up in the public eye we do give them some privacy and we should give them more I think but nonetheless they are public property too and they will be dealing with this when they go to school for example there will be people saying oh I saw your mummy is not well for example I mean there's there's a lot there's a lot that they'll have to deal with in all of this as well above and beyond what uh, a normal uh, I mean what's normal but a, a straightforward ordinary private citizen would have to deal with absolutely and that's probably what has taken time because you've got to tell them that the way it's going to play out is that we're going to have to deal with this this is what mommy and daddy are going to go through but when you go to school people might say this people in the street might say might yell that just know that when it happens this is what it really means this is the truth come home we will look after you and you have to kind of constantly be on the lookout and remember for the isolation of kate and herself the job as a mother doesn't stop the job as being you are the mother of the future king doesn't stop so while she's dealing with what she's going through she's constantly got to be aware that how do i soothe them how do i protect them how do i nurture yeah. them through it it's a lot to carry. So please, people going forward, you have to be mindful that think of what it is to just be a human being. And then think what it is to be a human being going through one of a tragic human experience with the optics of the world on you. There must be a heightened level of sensitivity because you run the risk of doing her extra harm because of the psychological mm. pressure you put her under. Judita, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Really, really interesting talking to you. We'll definitely have you on again. I know we've had you on before, but we'll definitely have you on again. Judita De Silva, who's a royal commentator. Thank you uh, to her. Jackie's been back in touch, actually, and I want to I want to address this, Jackie. Um, Jackie says, I appreciate this is a massive news story, but how is it respecting her privacy, discussing it continuously on the media? She's trying to, trying to protect her well-being and that of her children. Speculation on the media could be relayed to her children at school 
or friends. It's not about a news item. It's about what's the moral thing to do to assist in her recovery. Jackie, I totally get where you're coming from. We are a news station. We cover the news. This is undoubtedly a story. It's been all over the news. There's no doubt about that. But also, I think, Jackie, what we can do today is take a little look at how this has been covered, take a little look at ourselves, perhaps, in the media and as a society as well, as I mentioned a minute ago, and say, how do we get this right the next time? actually, when there's a public figure who is in this situation. And all these people, as actually another person, um, Mark Aston, has been in touch. He says, I've recently gone uh, through chemotherapy for prostate cancer. Mark, I, I hope you're well. I actually bought a boat so I could escape and have time to deal with the after effects of the treatment. They're not pleasant and you need space to deal with them. And actually, on Jackie's point, Nicola in Barnsley has been in touch. I wonder what you make of this, Jackie. Maybe you send me another message. Nicola in Barnsley says, My thoughts and prayers go out to the Princess of Wales and King Charles. We should leave her and the King alone to recover in peace. I also think the celebrities jumping on the Where's Kate bandwagon should publicly apologise. That's a very interesting one because there are so many people who will send tweets, will put things out, will, uh, you know, not just public figures, private figures as well, indulging in all that speculation, who will put things into the public domain and actually not ever apologise and not ever feel uh, be held accountable for it. So listen, thank you to all your thought, for all your thoughts on that. Penny in Essex as well, I want to read out this one, really interesting one. Good morning, uh, good morning favourite Peter, says Penny, very kind of you, thank you Penny. Uh, regarding Kate's cancer diagnosis, when my husband had cancer, we kept it quiet because it wasn't anyone's business. It wasn't a serious one which would have spread or killed him. He's been clear for 11 years now. That's brilliant, Penny. I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, she continues, We managed to keep it from our neighbours until he was well. When my first husband died of cancer, it was awful, with neighbours crossing a road because they didn't know what to say. People felt sorry for us, didn't need it. Privacy is always best in my case. My goodness, Penny, you haven't had your sorrows to seek. Um, I'm so sorry to hear about your first husband. I'm delighted that your uh, husband, um, uh, your current husband, has uh, recovered. That's great news. Uh, but I, I know exactly what you mean, and, and you are public property, even if you're a private citizen, nor normal, ordinary person, not someone who's uh, Princess Kate. And we will be talking about this a little bit later on with someone whose husband was public property, someone I know very, very well indeed. Uh, Cliff in Berkshire says, Morning, Peter. I felt sad to see a Royal Highness sitting there telling us about her illness. I feel she was forced to do it. I heard one of Talk TV's presenters say that we should be told everything about the Royal Family because we fund them. I think that attitude is wrong. Should we know everything about everyone on benefits, for example, because we fund them too? The Royal Family costs us 63 pence a year. If I give the presenter 63 pence a year, would he give me access to all his private information and business, says Cliff in Berkshire. I'm not sure who you're actually referring to there, Cliff, and I'm not going to prove that too deeply because we are colleagues here. But listen, we, uh, of course, as presenters, as, as people on this station, we all often don't agree with one another. Often you see it on air. Um, I've certainly had numerous uh, clashes with various colleagues and we get on well afterwards. But yes, you're absolutely right, Cliff, to make those points and to say that uh, there have been people in the media, including on this station, demanding this kind of information. Well, listen, listen now we have it. Now there is no... There is clearly absolutely no ambiguity in terms of what Princess Kate is dealing with. We haven't been kept anything from us, the speculation, the, the story, which of course we covered over the photo and the Photoshop photo and all the rest of it. The issue is trust and the royal family, uh, w whether they've been forced to or not, and I think they probably have been forced to actually, and we can talk about that if you want to. We've been given this information, we've been trusted with this information. Let's use it wisely, let's get uh, let's deal with this properly and let's learn lessons about the next time because it has been pretty unedifying, actually, what has happened in regard to Princess Kate. We're going to continue talking about this with my panel next. Jonathan Less and Connor Tomlinson are coming up. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, what did fail her. Yeah, it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Lots of people getting in touch on text and tweet and indeed WhatsApp as well. Uh, no lessons need to be learned, Peter. It's called being a human being. Social media has caused a complete loss of kindness, sympathy and empathy. Catherine is a mother and a wife. We do not own her, says uh, someone using capital letters and exclamation marks. Clearly angry about this. There's lots of people angry about this story. And we're going to reflect that today. Christine and Surrey says social media is a blessing and a curse. Everything is at the touch of a button with little fact checking. God love Princess Catherine and her family, specifically the children. What a nightmare, says Christine. Mick says the media have not learned lessons after Diana Peter. Jackie is right, just stop. Talk is not innocent, says Mick. Simon says Kate isn't just a celebrity, she is our future queen. Most people are concerned about her well-being as the royal family are part of her heritage and national identity together with her personality and works are impeccable, says Simon. Jonathan in Bournemouth has given me a ring, 0344 499 1000. Jonathan, great to talk to you. What point would you like oh, to make this you, morning? Peter. Hi, yeah. And you, Peter. Yeah, we've spoken once before. It's been <laughs> a few weeks ago. Yeah, do you know, a couple of points, um, Peter. Do you know what I found really distasteful was the way they kind of rushed um, Kate to get better, kind of like forcing her recovery through prematurely, you know, like sort of hurrying her, you know, rushing her to get better. You know, you wouldn't do that with a friend or family member, would you, you know? Um, yes, that's right. I mean, I think I think that's a good point, Jonathan, in that in the fact that it's sort of saying, well, if she's got an abdominal surgery, if she's had if she's had surgery, well, she should be better by now. Yeah. She should be back out, out doing what what she's doing. Do you think she's been sort of forced into making this 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 uh, yeah. this this extraordinary video? This is another thing. Just generally speaking, I suppose I'm, I'm neither a royalist or a republican. I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, like probably a reformist, really. Okay. A reformist royalist. <laughs> uh, but I, I think what I think generally think. People seem to think these people are privileged and they're so wealthy and they're so privileged. But I question whether that's true. Are they really privileged? I mean, every, everything you do is scrutinized. You know, everyone's talking about you. You've got no privacy, really, let's face it. You can't really go anywhere. Um, so are they actually privileged or is it... Is it's it a real goldfish bowl. I mean, if, you if, if, you, if you had all that money and no accountability and no sort of public facing rule, it would be very nice and you could live in, in, in the lap of luxury as some a very, very small number of people do, but certainly you're right. Uh, but then of course, some people would say to that, look, I, I basically agree with you, Jonathan, but I think some people would say, well, actually, uh, Kate married into the royal family. She made a choice, whereas William and her children haven't made a choice. That's, that's where they are and that's their life and that's destined for them. That's a really good point, actually. Yeah, I mean, to, actually choosing to marry into it, unless of course you 
you know, they say you don't choose who you fall in love with, do they? Well, but that's true, and that <laughs> <on>, leads <laughs> me to another you point. Know, and if, you come, if you're brought up on a council estate and you fall in love with somebody from aristocracy, I mean, that... It does happen, doesn't it? Well, uh, it would be, be quite nice to marry well. But, Jonathan, and, and, and another another point, I suppose, I want to ask you, because you, you'll perhaps have thought about this as someone maybe in the middle a little bit in regard to the royal family. I mean, Harry and Meghan, actually, maybe Harry's made the right choice to say, do you know what? I don't want to be part of the circus. I don't want to have all the speculation, if God forbid, and something happens uh, to him, which I hope it doesn't, and I hope he lives a long and happy life. But imagine something like this did happen. Well, actually, that's none of our business either. No. I mean, if he had made that decision, then fair enough. But there's a difference, isn't there, Peter, between that and um, really, really toxically a a attacking the royal family um, as much as he has. I mean, that's very distasteful, isn't it? I mean, making the decision you just mentioned is one thing, but then just being so obsessively attacking towards the royal family like he has. I mean, you know, sometimes I hear some of this stuff about Harry and Meghan, and I think, is this actually real? Is this actually really happening? Because what we're hearing is so crazy and off the scale, isn't it? And you think, are they really like that? Is this really happening? Are they that bad? So, sometimes you know it's spin, mean? but then sometimes, you know, he did he did write the memoir and so on. So, yeah. What, what When you were watching that video, I mean, everyone's seen perhaps a bit of it or all of it. It's only about two and a half minutes from uh, Princess Kate yesterday. I mean, what was your reaction when you, when you saw that she was sitting on that bench with great dignity, uh, but also yeah. she was clearly, you know, it was clearly emotional video for her as yeah. well, as you would expect for someone dealing with such an incredibly uh, life-changing uh, set of health circumstances, but also the scrutiny she's been under for such a long time. I thought it was very tasteful, very well-rounded, very elegant, very classy, very humble. At first I thought, is that her? I didn't. I wasn't sure if it was It was even her, you know, because she looked, you know, sort of so grey, you know, but yeah. then that's, that's understandable. Yeah, but and, and thin as well, but listen, you know? that, that's, that's part of it, that's part of the treatment she'll be but going under. They didn't under try and, and glamorise anything. She didn't, there was not, they didn't try and glamorise her, did they? It was very humble. It was very know, straightforward, like, I thought. A public servant, you know, mm. just doing doing her duty. And, and, and I just think it was distasteful the way, before we knew about the cancer, you know, the way they tried to sort of force through her recovery and rush her to get yeah. better. I mean, yeah. if you had a friend or family member who was ill, you'd just give them time, wouldn't you, to get better as long as it takes, you know. Um, you know, you don't, you don't rush it, do you? You're, you're, you're absolutely right, Jonathan. To, no, I, to I think... naturally, but with her, we have to kind of rush it through, force it through. Well, we, 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 want, we want everything. We want to know... Content. We want to know all the detail yesterday. Listen, thank you very, very much indeed, oh, Jonathan. Thank you, you Peter. Make some, it's been great to chat. Great to chat, too. You make some really, really good points. Um, thank you for that. Um, Anna has been in touch, says, Morning, Peter. I do believe discussing the situation with the Princess of Wales is correct. It can be done in a respectful, considerate way. The problem we have now is with those who bullied, belittled, mocked and forced her to make an announcement. She may be a public servant, but as Judita said earlier, we are not entitled to your private information on her health. As usual, you're reporting the story of professionalism, respect and consideration. The media must pull back from the shock, dramatic way of forcing out the news that causes the harm and fuels the hate and bitterness directed at people they may not like. Godspeed her recovery, says Anna. Well, thank you for that. Plenty to discuss on this and actually a number of other issues. I'm delighted Connor Tomlinson, the political commentator, is in the studio, as is Jonathan Liss as well, uh, who I spoke to yesterday, actually, on a very different topic. Um, Jonathan uh, is a political commentator as well, but on this matter of the royal family, how do you think this has been dealt with, uh, Jonathan, by the royal family and by those who are reacting to it today? I think there's always a difficult balance, isn't there, between... Uh, a, a member of the royal family as a human being with a right to privacy and you know the same rights that we all have to uh, a private life and a kind of an instrument of the state and that's always the way that the royal family is particularly when you have the senior royals you know this is the future queen and so I think people do have a right to know and also I think a lot of it came from genuine concern it wasn't just prurience uh, people were concerned, why isn't she being seen? What's wrong with her? Why aren't they telling us stuff? And obviously that whole debacle of the photograph just added to the sense that um, the palace wasn't quite being truthful, that things are being manipulated. And even, you know, you know, even Rachel Johnson, you know, he's like, quite you know, a respected journalist, you know, wrote an article in the Evening Standard yesterday um, saying, before the before this video came mm -hmm. out, um, so arguing that uh, the, the, the woman at the flower shop or the farm shop clearly wasn't Kate. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of like cross the species bar, if you like, from kind of just online conspiracy theory to sort of mainstream. It's really interesting you mentioned that, actually. I've just been sent a tweet by Carol 
Nicole Decker, the Tapoi singer, she's in her 60s, but was, was very well known in her day. And she has tweeted um, this morning already, actually, I think it was in the last few minutes. Last week, I posted a tweet querying the validity of the video of Wills and Kate at the Windsor Farm Shop, says Carol Decker. I genuinely did not think it looked like them. I accept now it was genuine. I did not mean to contribute to the unpleasant fury surrounding Kate's health. I have deleted it. I think, I mean, good for Carol Decker for standing up and, uh, I mean, she shouldn't have done it in the first place, but good for her for um, at least apologising for that. There are a lot of people with egg on their faces today and not just uh, not just ordinary members of the public who've been speculating on Twitter for a long time, but quite a few public figures as well. Yeah, I think that, you know, I think the people who have talked about this online um, do need some time to reflect on this, that these are human beings, uh, particularly when you know. But I also think that, you know, could it have been handled better? I mean, now we know about the circumstances. Did Kate really need to be dragged into that photo controversy? Did, uh, did she need to sort of issue a statement when she was going through, you know, sort of chemotherapy that she has to sort of now sort of bear the, the sort of the force of all the, the those those spec that speculation well, about let's having to? Well, let's examine that, Jonathan. Uh, before, uh, yeah, before, before I come to Connor, let's examine that. Do you think she did that voluntarily? Was she forced to do it? Do you think that was the PR machine, or do you think that was the media, social media? I mean. What 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 was the set of circumstances that got us to that point? I have absolutely no idea what happened with that photograph, and obviously none of us does. But it just seems, in light of what was happening, she seemed to have quite enough on her plate with a cancer diagnosis and telling three young children about that without well, having five, to, without remember. having to become you know, the centre of a media milestrom for an entire news cycle that dominated. Uh, you know, so like the BBC headlines but for, will, for a day I mean, or two. The, 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 I, I totally, I basically agree with you, but I suppose with the video yesterday, at least it will bookend it, and at least we all know everything now, and we can say we can examine the facts rather than talking about speculation. I suppose, Connor, what do you make of this? I think it's less a matter about a right to privacy, and more if you're in the public eye, what is prudent to do, and I don't think those around the royals did a prudent. Uh, strategy of managing perceptions of this. I think Kate's video coming out and saying in a very personable way, look, okay, I'm, I, I've got bowel cancer, essentially. I'm now in treatment for it. I've had surgery for it. Now please give my family some privacy. Should have been the way to go from the off. I understand that it might have been a sense of personal embarrassment for well, her. Well, we don't know it's but... bowel cancer. It's, it's sort of preventative treatment. Well, it's she, preventative chemotherapy. She says that the, there is... She used the word cancer, therefore people will go, oh, okay, right. Yeah, so this but, is, but, this is but we cancer. don't know if she actually has okay. cancer. So, fair, yeah. fair, anyway, fair anyway. point, yeah. But that was a better way of handling it than the manipulated photo, which was shoddily done. A press release which said that in her amateur photography, Kate has decided to manipulate that photo. We don't know if Kate wrote the statement, we don't know if Kate actually edited the photo, we just have to take the word on it. And then well, the, the video tweet that was then, put out had a C on it which said it was from her herself. Sure. We don't actually know if it was written or not. We actually have to set the word for that. We now know this is what's fueled speculation. We now know this is the case because Kate has done the video. Until then, wild speculation was allowed to run forward because well, you, say, you say allowed to run forward. I mean that that's. I mean, isn't there some sense where we actually say these people have some right to privacy? I mean, you're saying the, the people will always speculate when there's a vacuum, but at the same time, shouldn't we in some way have said, well, stop speculating? We can call prescriptively, yes, but we all know that people will still speculate. That's and, and also, not being funny, in the last how many years, and I'm not justifying it, the last how many years, how many times have the media misled the public on mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. uh, COVID or uh, all sorts of other mainstream narratives, therefore people are primed to think the most mistrustful interpretation is the right one to the point of where you've got a video of Kate walking down the street and people are thinking it's a body double, right? That's yeah. where people's minds are yeah. going to go to. So if they I mean, wanted to manage expectations, the it, new video is the right way to do it. it. It's right to have critical faculties, definitely, and to, to, to look at what you're told critically and to look at, you know, if you read something in a newspaper of any description to be a little bit sceptical and say maybe there's an agenda there. But Jonathan, uh, nonetheless, facts are facts. But yeah, I think there's also a, a media element here that, you know, in the last few months, it's, I've sort of thought that not that much has changed since 1936, actually, uh, when famously you had, you know, the world's media talking about the king's relationship with the divorced woman and the British media didn't touch it. And that's why the abdication um, came as such a, a shock to everyone in this country because no one had known about the story because the media had been so sort of deferentially treating it. And I think that there was an 
there was a kind of a subtext now that people were talking about, the journalists were talking about things um, as though they sort of knew what was happening. Uh, and well, they the, the didn't. general, but the, that was, I think that a lot of people thought that we're not being told stuff and that there's still kind of like a media deference, whether or not that was true. I think the same thing has been. You think there's the a case. media deference? Well, I, no, I not think everybody I think would say that. People, that I, a lot of people would say actually the media were far too aggressive in saying that, you know, we must know what's going on with but Kate. Actually the, but actually, when it comes to William and Kate, the media has sort of had a little bit of a hands off approach. I'm not saying that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, by the way, but I'm saying that I think a lot of people, that's what might have fueled some of the online fury. The sense that um, so the media is not getting into this story, so we're going to do the story instead. We're going to sort of, you know, you saw all these sort of viral tweets, mm. you know, these sort of, you know, these DIY detectives plotting, a sort of, you know, videos and what might have happened uh, to Kate that we weren't being told about because sort of, you know, mainstream journalists weren't doing that, you know, for, for, for good well, reason, a, of course. Well, well, it's really interesting, Jonathan, that this is kind of, I'm not disagreeing with you necessarily, but there's, there's, a, there's a wider thing here where, in previous years, before the age of social media, essentially, Connor, you know, it was almost as if the news was sort of handed down on tablets of stone by a newsreader sitting behind a desk on the BBC saying, this is what has happened. But as we know from so many inquiries, from so much history, so many look, l looks back at what has happened over the years, there was loads we weren't told, there was loads that we should have known and didn't know, and there was lots of cover-up and uh, conspiracy in a, in a different sense in that way. So really, I suppose, the media sense we have now and the, the uh, democratisation of all of this is perhaps a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah, obviously, the, the one of the great examples of this is in the 1930s. The New York Times knew about the Holodomor being conducted by the Stalinists and completely covered up for it. So the fact that we've now democratised the public space means that citizen journalists can do some really great work. They can also, if the truth doesn't exist and the truth is Per Ockham's razor, far simpler than we actually often expect, run away with the most absurd interpretation possible. But I, I will say this as well that this might be a perspective for someone born well after the fever pitch of tabloid journalism, well after the death of Diana as well, because I was born in 98, right? There is a general sense of either apathy or mistrust around the royal family as it goes on. We see a rise in republicanism, we see uh, Charles before he became king taking a more political role and lots of people were polarised by that. We see even Will coming out and putting his opinion out there about Israel Gaza which is uncharacteristic I would say, particularly of his late grandmother the Queen. And so the royals have a bit of reputation to mm -hmm. get back with mm -hmm. a public who aren't necessarily really royalist, and I think they should have done this video earlier rather than allow speculation to run away with them. Well, I think that one 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 parallel that did come out to me watching that video was the Queen in Buckingham Palace in 1997, where there was a sense that uh, you know the the royals. The royal family is not in control of the story yes, anymore, yes. and that she was kind of the, the, the monarch was basically forced to talk forced. about Diana. The monarch was Diana almost died, forced, yeah. you know, sort of, you know, sort of Charles the First, or obviously with far lower stakes, to kind of just to speak to her people mm -hmm. about something that uh, the people were very, very uh, worked up about and very upset about. Well, they wanted and, to hear from the yeah, queen. Yeah, and so and it's almost like the, 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 the royal family, in a way, had to kind of submit to mm -hmm. public pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there is discussion about whether that was the case. Uh, you know, so people saying that you know, Kate was waiting until the Easter holidays to do this video. Would they have done it if, uh, you know, social media hadn't taken off? I, I wonder, to be honest. But well, I, I at the same time, they've gone on for a few more months. I, 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 here, I, think, so. I think she was kind of forced into it. Great uh, message here from Ian. I think this is the best text message I've received so far this morning. Hi, Peter. It's very simple as well. Hi, Peter. Today's story is not Kate's cancer. Today's story is how, she, how people treated her. That's absolutely spot on. That's what we we're discussing this morning. I want to take a few more messages on this and then in the next section after the break with uh, Connor and uh, Jonathan, I want to talk about other stories that are happening, including a very, very important story in Russia, about 100 people um, uh, dead there. Sean in Edinburgh says, Morning, Peter. If Catherine wants to announce her cancer diagnosis, then that is her business. The conspiracy theorists who come up with the nonsense are so cold on what they come up with. Shane in Sydney says, Hi, uh, good day, Peter. I wish Princess Kate all the best. Kate's health has been the main story down here and I hope the Aussie media give them a break another great show on Saturday I hope Jack is good says she and thank you um, uh, one person says at the end of the day Kate is only human she's a mum and wife who oh, just happens to be royalty leave her alone to cope with her illness Brian says I think the people are it's people wanting the truth people in the media are all influencers we're fed up with lies and spin that prevents speculation we're a modern society and the likes of Boris Johnson amongst others have fueled this demand for pure truth uh, again, what is the truth is a big, very big issue, although we know the very straightforward facts and we know the truth now in regard to uh, Princess Kate. 
Cyril has been in touch. Says my wife died at 63 with ovarian cancer. Cyril, I'm really sorry to hear that happened. I sensed this is what Kate has. Well, we don't know that, and we were told it's a, it's a stomach condition due to the timetable of events, major op, etc. My wife fought for six years with a hidden strength I never knew she had. I just hope a better outcome here. Uh, P.S. The chemo is worth worse than the illness, says Cyril. Paul has been in touch to say, uh, final one here before the break, says, I recently found out the amount of speculation and conspiracy around uh, Princess of Wales to be disturbing. The entitlement of some people on social media is fairly disgusting at the best of times, let alone currently. I am a cancer survivor of lymphoma and I'll be in remission for 10 years later this year. Paul, that's great. I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, it really hurts me to think that both the King and Princess of Wales have been somewhat forced to lay bare their struggles through ridiculous speculation. It reminds me of how hard it was for me to tell friends and family at the age of 24 what I was facing. Thank you very much for your balanced and sensitive coverage of it all. All the best, says Paul. Paul, thank you. We're going to leave this uh, until 11 o'clock. We're going to talk, talk about it uh, with um, an oncologist, actually, at 11 o'clock and also another at Royal commentator, but we're going to talk about other things for a few minutes. There are lots of stories that also deserve your attention. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the Statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, it was, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, as I said, we're going to leave Princess Kate just for a few minutes to deal with another few stories because there's 115 people dead in uh, what appears to be a terror attack 
in Russia, in Moscow, and Islamic State has claimed responsibility, although we don't know what bit of Islamic State it is. Uh, um, there are, the death toll now at 115. Uh, also, many people left fighting for their lives when gunmen in camouflage clothing opened fire with automatic weapons. This was people at the Cro Crocus City Hall uh, yesterday. Three men named by authorities believed to be the killers are feared to be on the run uh, in regard to that. There are people seeing a Soviet-era rock group called Picnic. They were about to perform at 8 o'clock when this horrendous massacre began. Uh, Jonathan Liss, this is just absolutely dreadful in terms of what has happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, all terrorist attacks are horrendous and this seems to have been an extremely serious one with, with many, many casualties and perhaps uh, more sadly uh, to come. I just saw a, a news alert that the Russian authorities have arrested um, some suspects okay. on their way to um, the border. They were trying to flee. As with everything in Russia, one does have to take what the Russian authorities say with a significant grain of salt. Obviously, the fact that there's been an attack is obviously not uh, in dispute. Yeah. Um, but uh, we know that the Russians do not necessarily have a good track record when it comes to uh, sort of attributing blame for attacks. Uh, yeah, there's although, very... although ISIS have actually, uh, sorry, they, but, they, but, they, yes, they've, they've claimed they responsibility have, for but, this. But they also have claimed responsibility for things they haven't had anything to do with in the past. And That's also we, we true. Do, and we know, uh, you know, there's there's a there is strong evidence that in the uh, terrorist attacks that, that happened in Moscow, with do you remember the, when the apartment blocks? Uh, were blown up. I think it was in sort of 1999 or maybe just after that, uh, and which precipitated a major offensive in Chechnya at the time. Uh, there was um, some evidence uh, and allegations that that was, uh, you know, a, a false flag in order uh, to kind of to provide that pretext. So, well, you know, one always has to be careful with these things. And also with the proximity of the Russian elections. Um, well, there are so many elements of this. We're actually going to talk to Mary Dijewski about this, hopefully tomorrow, if Mary's available. Um, to Obviously, we're dominated by the Princess Kate stuff today, but this is a big, big story in Russia, and we're not going to ignore it. We're not ignoring it today, but we're going to talk about it in more depth, hopefully, on the show tomorrow I'm on between 10 and 1 as you may know in a statement released on Telegram last night this is the messaging app Telegram uh, the extremist group said IS fighters attacked a large gathering on the outskirts of the Russian capital Moscow before they had as they put it retreated to their bases safely but as Jonathan says there do seem to be some arrests here Connor what do you make of this? Well the Russians have been battling ISIS in Syria for a long time I don't think it would be the same central IS as the UK and US forces fought before because as we know the Trump administration took a large amount of their territory and resources away from them from sustained bombing campaigns but it's not impossible this is a splinter group but as you already said Jonathan I mean especially after the Russian election you cannot know whether or not this is a false flag because as George Frost Kennan said in the 50s he was Kennedy's ambassador to Yugoslavia the Soviet Union which Putin often blames for mismanaging Russia but also idolizes for winning the Second World War. Um, they often demonised the outside West and said we are under constant attack, therefore we must uh, shore up our state surveillance, we must ensure that we have autocratic power, we must ma manage the economy, because there is always an existential threat beyond the borders that could attack from within. So it is a very useful, and I'm not saying it's good, obviously, very useful thing for Putin to then turn around and say, because this is happening, we must have more security. Well, well, we'll see what we'll see what their reaction to that but is. Just one, but I guess one thing that would sort of militate against the kind of any false flag argument, and I'm not making, I'm not suggesting no, sure, this is a sure, false flag. Sure. I'm just saying that there is, there is uh, there are allegations that the Russians have been responsible for false flag attacks in the past. Yes, uh, but the one thing that would militate against that is the fact that the US um, did put out quite an unusual public statement because you normally think that will go through sort of um, private intelligence channels uh, about uh, a, an explicit threat uh, to large gatherings in Russia. I think that was just two weeks ago yeah. uh, in, the, in, the, in the, for the next couple of weeks. And so with that in mind, uh, you know, I suppose if you were in Russia, was that did did ordinary people necessarily know that because we know that the Russians have blocked so sort of, you know sort of social media channels that sort of ordinary Russians have great difficulty in accessing non Kremlin sanctioned yeah. news sources. We, we often know a lot more about it. Hold, right, just, hold, right. hold fire for a second because I want to put a point to you, Connor. Um, what Leo has uh, WhatsApped in. Morning, Peter. Hope you're well. Regarding the terrorist attacks in Moscow, how much do we know about the threat that the Islamist extremism poses to Russia in comparison to the West? And is it even possible? To
to divorce it from what's happening in Ukraine. Interesting point. What so do you think of that? I'll firstly say about the threat of potential Islamic extremism. Putin has been arming various Islamic militants to act as supplementary forces during the Ukrainian war. So he has allied with Muslims in Chechnya and, and the like. Um, there is actually a, a large problem with Islamic extremism in that region. That's why you get so many UFC fighters, because often they go down there to do something productive rather than... UFC? Than UFC fighters. So, mm. like, um, uh, oh, blooming hell. Um, one of the, the Khabib brothers, right? Some of the main champions are because they're so dedicated to that rather mm. than going down the path of Islamic extremism. They okay. want to give the men something okay. productive. So it's not impossible. But picking up on that, there was a piece in the New York Times a couple of days before this happened, essentially predicting that there could be a large-scale terror attack. So whether or not the Ukrainians or the American State Department were involved in something like this, this will be certainly something that Putin can point to and say, well, how did they know this was happening? Mm. Were the Americans involved in launching an attack on Russian soil? We're essentially at war against the West, therefore we need to double down on the war effort. Okay, I want to talk about uh, report now about it is four years today since the lockdowns and uh, the lo the fact that long-term illness has put economic inactivity at the highest rate since the 1990s. This is the report in the Times today saying the young and old are driving the longest rise in economic activity since the 1990s. Almost all the increase is concentrated in those under 25 and over 50 with the post-COVID trend only a month short of the 55 months of increasing inactivity seen in the mid-1990s long-term term sickness, the analyst warns. Connor, we've uh, had so many effects from the lockdowns, some we don't even know about yet and some we know we need to know more about, but certainly in terms of growth, in terms of the economy, it's had a massive effect. Yeah, GDP per capita has stagnated since before lockdowns. There's a trend of people online, it's called NEETS, and it means not in education, employment or training. And this is growing in England, America and the like, because the more people go to university, the more people that take on university debt, especially in the States, and then enter the job market after a couple of years of lockdown and the competition for new roles is increasing with more people coming over, um, trained elsewhere, and because the job isn't paying well enough and because rent is so high and the like. And now with all of these new diagnosed mental health conditions, because the rates are going up exponentially, people are just going, right, I'm depressed, my job doesn't pay enough, it's really hard to get uh, out from under the boot heel of inflation, why should I even bother working when I could just sit home on job seeking? Do you really think there are a lot of people who, who have made that decision? Could, quite, yeah. I don't know if it's that rational, but it does make sense for quite a lot of Gen Z. I'm not endorsing okay. it, I'm just saying sure, it's a no, calculation they've Liz, made. Liz Kendall, who's the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, has said uh, 14 years of Tory economic failure has left millions of people locked out of work due to long-term sickness at terrible costs to them, to business and to taxpayers facing a spiralling benefits bill. Jonathan. Well, you know, obviously, there is no one's denying that we have a big problem here. Um, and I suppose that you can approach the problem from different perspectives. Um, I think there are a lot of people on the right who kind of have a knee jerk sort of Thatcherite response, which is there are people who are shirking. Uh, we need to get them into work. And that was sort of the approach of the austerity government or the coalition government, to give it its formal title. Uh, you know, when we did have, you know, I think every sort of 10 or 15 years, this, this whole kind of rhetoric comes round again when we're sort of blaming benefit claimants uh, for basically all of society's ills. And, you know, we saw that in the dehumanisation of, of people on incapacity benefits, for example, in the coalition years where they had, did have to go through these, you know, incredibly gruelling tests. And we saw, you know, that people took their own lives at, at and it was a really, really, really a miserable time for a lot of people in this country. And so there is there is obviously an issue, but I just I don't accept this idea that uh, there are sort of people just that a majority or anywhere near a majority of people that are deliberately gaming the system that are sort of sitting back. In any living system, their there life. will be some of people. Of course, they're always going the system, to be, but it's not the majority. No, not the majority and, and actually, as a taxpayer who wants as low taxes as possible, I have absolutely no problem with my taxes going to people who genuinely account cannot work, for example, or can't work some of the time. That doesn't bother me in the slightest. That, that's, what, that's what society is for. We're there to, uh, do, to help people and what government should do, in my opinion, is help people who can't help themselves. There's a big debate, but we'll come back to it, no doubt. But just before we go, um, coming from Northern Ireland, I know all about controversies to do with flags. Uh, that is something we do really well in Northern Ireland. And there is, of course, this controversy over the new Nike home kit uh, with the Three Lions colour change. Uh, this is to do with football, uh, so not my area of expertise, but a multicoloured flag on the England kit. I'm neither from England nor do I know very much about football. Connor, do you care? I... OK, it's m hard to muster up the fact to care because I'm not a football fan. I just 
I'm not sure why anyone's surprised why Nike would do this or why we would believe their excuse that, oh, we were just paying homage to the 1966 kit, which it just conveniently happens to look nothing like, when <laughs> they donated loads to BLM, they, alongside most of the FA, have already taken the knee and the like, they have demonised our country in the US as systemically racist, even Gareth Southgate's come out and said, look, it's not very good, is it? I mean, at least we've got three lions, that's our distinguishing feature, but it's not the flag we recognise. You didn't need to screw with it, you could have just left it as it is and avoided this whole thing. Jonathan, you're a dedicated follower of fashion, no doubt you will be going out and spending £125 on this kit. It's one of those stories that comes up where you kind of think that the entire country must have just taken some kind of psychedelic drug. It, it's United, and the, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, and, 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 and I think, Am I the crazy person here, or am I the only person here who thinks this is at the, the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? We There are so many real things to get upset about in this country. There are, you know, everyone can agree that Britain is not in a good place right now uh, in so many ways, and we're having an argument about a flag on a shirt. It's so, so ridiculous. And the fact that... You should come to Northern Ireland. The fact that Keir... Well, you yes. Learn, you learn well, so much more about flag. Well, well, that's, the flag, we do them the really flag, well. The flag controversy in Northern Ireland is at least born out of several hundred years of history. This is just such a, a confected row about nothing. I think that we just need to move on and talk about things that actually matter. Thank you both very, very much indeed, Jonathan Less is a political commentator, as is Connor Tomlinson uh, giving us their take on the views uh, on all the stories today, including the big one about Princess Kate. Lots of people getting in touch about that. I'll take more of your calls, texts and tweets, of course, in the next hour. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Please let me know your thoughts on this. Lots of diverse opinions. And thank you to Connor and Jonathan. Stay with us here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. the ghost of Margaret Thatcher. She said, you've got to watch. That was the woke that was 10 o'clock Saturday night with Lizzie Cundy, Henry Bolton, Pete Barnes, and of course, the woke woman! Well, hello there. This is Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. Thank you so much for your company. We've had a really interesting, and I think actually quite thoughtful, first star of this programme. Thank you to everybody who's been in touch with all of your thoughts, mainly on Princess Kate. We've discussed another few issues as well. Of course, we've discussed the horrendous terrorist attack on that theatre, that music concert in Russia, where the current death toll is 115. We'll continue to discuss that. But Princess Kate and her cancer, or at least not cancer as we know it necessarily, but her treatment for cancer, uh, chemotherapy, which is hopefully preventative, hopefully she doesn't have it. Uh, we will continue to discuss that. And of course, how the media and uh, social media and we as a society really have responded to that. We'll be talking to Richard Fitzwilliams. We'll also be talking to Lawrence Young, who's a professor of molecular oncology at uh, Warwick University. Kathy Brokenshire has been on this program a few times. You might know that I used to work for her husband, James Brokenshire, who very sadly died of lung cancer. Now, Kathy knows all about dealing with cancer in the public domain. James was a conservative politician, obviously not nearly well known uh, as uh, Princess Kate, but Kathy knows some of the kind of things that Princess Kate will be thinking now in terms of her kids, in terms of what you tell people, how much you put in the public domain, how you deal with the avalanche of well-wishers as well. That's another very, very big thing. So we're going to talk to her about that as well. And this hour, we're going to talk about something which I know is a big issue for many people, potholes. There are so many of them right up and down the country. I don't know about you, but I think if any political party said, you know what, we're going to fill in every single pothole in this country within a year, they get my vote. Anyway, the key thing on this programme is it's my show, but it's your show too. I want you to let me know your thoughts on all of these issues. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text me 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. You can also WhatsApp now as well with a voice message or a text message 0344 499 1000. Let's spend the next couple of hours together here on Talk TV. Rosie has been in touch from Wales. Hi, Peter. I'm waiting now for all the apologies that should be falling like rain about our lovely future queen from the disgusting trolls that forced her into a corner like a trapped animal. You see, they're still at it on many media sites and in some newspapers. Coincidentally, we find she made this heartrending video only hours after us learning three were caught trying to breach her medical records. Yeah, that was a story on Thursday. Damage control, maybe? We do not need to know anything more except news of her full recovery and return to the hearts of the British people who love her, sending good vibes to Kate William and the children from Wales, where we live, says Rosie. So thank you very, very much indeed for that. Good morning, Peter. Uh, great to see you as always. Though a rather sombre start to your programme, naturally my thoughts and prayers are with our King, Charles and Princess Catherine, but I'm also thinking about Prince William and the awful time it is for him, both his beloved wife and dad, seriously ill at the same time. I cannot imagine how he must feel. I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but I don't feel your guest, Mr Tomlinson, Connor Tomlinson, who was on before the break, should speculate on what cancer the princess has. I think uh, the fact now we know she is ill is enough, says Joe. And that's right, and I did, I did bring up Connor Tomlinson on that. He mentioned a type of cancer. Now, we don't know, first of all, that she has cancer at all. We know she's receiving chemotherapy because of uh, preventative chemotherapy. This often happens, I'm not an expert, but we're going to talk to one in just a second. This often happens when there is, a, there is some sort of query about whether there is uh, cancer and she's having chemotherapy. And many people have been in touch saying, look, the chemotherapy itself can be worse than having the cancer, but that is the treatment as the best we have. Richard F Fitzwilliams is a royal commentator. Um, I'll chat to him in just a second. But Lawrence Young is Professor of Molecular Oncology at Warwick University. Um, Lawrence, I'll come to you first. And uh, I wonder, we'll watch the video again in a minute or two, but I wondered, Lawrence, what you thought 
of what Princess Kate said and the level of information she put into the public domain about her cancer. And uh, of course, what we what we now know from your perspective as an oncologist about her condition. Yeah, well, I, th I think she was very honest about the fact that she's facing uh, this preventative chemotherapy, something we call adjuvant chemotherapy, that she'd been through a significant surgery, um, not anticipating that cancer would be diagnosed, but then afterwards, after the surgery, after tissue had been removed, clearly there was some indication of cancer, and that she's going through this therapy. I thought it was a, I thought it was a very brave, brave message, but also a message of hope, particularly the way that she finished the uh, the, the interview. The, 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 she 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 was so honest about the, the 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 issue, but also raising the issue of hope. And we know that in her particular situation given the fact that this was an incidental finding after surgery, that she's very, very likely to come through this and be completely clear of cancer. But I think it was a message of hope for what is a very common disease. You know, the, a thousand people are diagnosed in this country with cancer every day. This is a very common disease. And what this demonstrates is it's no discriminator of age or of status. We're all susceptible to this disease. Can I, can I ask a, a, what might seem like a really stupid question, Lawrence? Um, cancerous cells have been found, we think. She's having chemotherapy for that. Um, and, but th th this isn't sort of full-blown cancer? Or how, how, would we, how would you describe her condition at the moment, from what, yeah, we, so from we, what we know? So, so we, we don't know enough detail. What's happened here is it's an incident, incidental finding. So what's happened is that she's had abdominal surgery. During that surgery tissue has been removed and when it's been analyzed by a pathologist they've found some cancer cells in that tissue now that means that there's some cancer possibly lurking elsewhere in the body it's possible but very unlikely but it's possible that there are a few cells around and you need to mop them up and what she's having is what she's called what's been referred to as preventative chemotherapy we call it adjuvant chemotherapy to make sure that you mop up those those cancer cells now the original diagnosis on the tissue that was removed from the princess will have given an indication not only of the type of cancer but also of, of the stage and grade of the tumor and it's likely to have been very very early one of the i guess dare i say out of all this one of the good things is this is an incidental finding many people who have preventative chemotherapy have it after they a tumor has been diagnosed and a lump has been removed surgically in this situation um, that hasn't been the case. This was an incidental finding. And in somebody young and otherwise fit, like the princess, the outcome is likely to be very, very positive. And as you said earlier, you know, Peter, there's no there's no point speculating about what type of cancer. All we know is that there is often um, a situation after you've had a tumour removed or an incidental finding of cancer in a tissue to have subsequent chemotherapy just is a is a precautional a precautional approach to ensuring that there's no cancer lurking anywhere else in the body from your perspective you have told um, i would imagine thousands of people over the course of your career that horrendous news you have cancer um, people deal with it in very very different ways we're going to be talking to someone whose whose husband had cancer in about 10 minutes time um lawrence but I mean, from your vast experience of people who have cancer, mostly, of course, vast majority of them not in the public eye, do the different approaches work in terms of telling people, not telling people? Is it best that this is in the public domain? Uh, it will obviously raise awareness and people will, I'm sure, uh, be inspired by what Princess Kate has done. But what do you make of sort of that element of it, Lawrence? Well, it's a very it's a very personal thing, isn't it? And it's a personal decision in terms of how you manage it personally. And so that does depend on you as an individual and 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 your type of personality. And we know there is a very significant psychological component to this. So the the way that you approach cancer, the way that you are supported not only by your medical team but by your family through this, is a really important part of dealing with the initial diagnosis and dealing with the inevitable consequences of what can sometimes be a not a, not a very nice therapy, actually. Um, and there's lots of evidence demonstrating how important the psychology of this is. So the way that you, as a doctor, break the news to a patient, the way that patient is then supported through that cancer journey, and we've got you know, fantastic support in this country through 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 the NHS, through uh, organisations like Macmillan, for instance. Um, 
uh, we do that bit really well, I have to say. But a lot of it is about an, the, you know, an individual and their individual psychology. And I think what the princess has done here in being so open about this is not only raise the whole profile of cancer, as indeed the king has done, but also demonstrated the fact that there is hope that you know, these days we have so much better treatments. If you look at cancer outcomes, you know, survival has more than doubled in the last 50 years in this country. And it's a consequence of, you know, better approaches to screening and diagnosis and much better approaches to cancer. And even the therapies are getting easier these days in terms of being able to deal with some of the side effects, new targeted therapies. Not, nonetheless, it is. I mean, yeah. chemotherapy is famously grueling. And uh, what, what will she be facing now in terms of the effects of that? Just talk us through that because we yeah. uh, most people know someone who's been through chemotherapy, but we often don't like to probe too deeply. Uh, I had a friend who had chemotherapy, uh, going to be talking to his wife in about 10 minutes on this program, and I, I, we reached an agreement actually where I said, I'm going to stop asking you how you are. He said, uh, he said well, thank you, because the answer is I'm feeling like, and he said a word I'm not going to repeat on this, on this station, but that cycle is very, very difficult for so many people. Yeah, well, so much of this depends on what type of cancer and what type of treatment, because there are some treatments these days that are very well tolerated. You can just take tablets for some time cancers and the side effects are, 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 are relatively few and relatively mild. What we're familiar with, however, is the usual combination chemotherapy where, where people are taking drugs that unfortunately have other side effects. So common side effects are tiredness and fatigue, nausea, um, and obviously we know one of the big side effects is the fact that chemotherapy can attack other cells in your body other than cancer cells, particularly your blood cells. So you become more susceptible to it, to infections. It, you can, it can lead to horrible things like mucositis where you get in, um, horrible ulcerases, uh, ulcers in your mouth, etc., mm. which make swallowing and eating difficult. But I, but I suspect that given the nature of early cancer diagnosis in the, in the princess's case, um, the the, the 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 treatments that you can use are are relatively mild compared to the very intensive chemotherapy you'd give somebody if they had been diagnosed with cancer that had already spread in your body. Thank you very much indeed. That's Professor Lawrence Young, Professor of Molecular Oncology at Warwick University. He is a uh, he is a cancer surgeon. Uh, we're going to talk to the royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams in a second, but I just want to remind ourselves of what Princess Kate said in that very brave message yesterday. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time it has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. 
the Princess of Wales telling cancer sufferers you are not alone and their families as well. Well, let's talk to Richard Fitzwilliams. He's a royal commentator. Richard, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Just by far and away the biggest story in the UK today. And there are lots of questions, not just about the fact that we now have total clarity. It's totally clear what has happened. The speculation now can end, can't it, Richard? It most certainly can. And indeed, this is, of course, one of the reasons for a video message of that type. It's completely unprecedented. And watching it, it was it was deeply moving. It was, well, it was a shock, a shock, I think, to everyone who, who watched it. And indeed, it showed what a remarkable person Catherine is. But there's no doubt at all that the speculation was one of the reasons for having it as well, of course, as the fact that that was the first day of the uh, holidays for her children. I mean, obviously, that was, it has been their priority in dealing with this. But on the other hand, I mean, the trolling, the some of them absolutely deplorable and, and disgusting theories, I mean, it, it just shows she's been in the eye of the hurricane. And when she has been so weak, a major operation followed by this, by um, the fact that she's undergoing preventative uh, chemotherapy. I mean, it's an absolutely appalling prospect. But equally, the positivity came through so well, and also, as has been mentioned, uh, talking about the hope that other cancer sufferers should have. I mean, I think it was uh, it was so beautifully handled, but what an ordeal. Mm. And the ordeal has not been made easier by all that speculation, as you mentioned. How much does social media, the media itself, maybe royal commentators, maybe presenters of programmes on Talk TV, how much do we actually have to examine our role in this, do you think, Richard? Well, I think social media is one thing because it's completely unpoliced. I can't see any future um, time when, in fact, it's going to be able, where we're going to be able to uh, stop some of this absolutely uh, grotesque behaviour because, I mean, some of what was on social media was absolutely appalling. Regarding uh, the press in general and regarding the role of royal commentators, it was, if you're a royal commentator, you um, talk about what you see and what you know and also there's a certain amount of speculation i mean there's no doubt and especially linked to that mothering sunday photograph which was absolutely charming but of course we know now that it was edited and that the major agencies wouldn't uh, uh, disseminate it or they would or, would, or they withdrew it uh, it's that was extremely unfortunate and mm -hmm. now Stand, and this links, of course, to the re the personal matter when William pulled out of his godfather King Constantine's memorial service. Now we understand what this was about, and I think it it's very very difficult to get this balance between privacy and it's the right to it, which undoubtedly Catherine has in private life. It, it, it is a very difficult balance, isn't it? Because they are to a degree public property, and we were given some information, but not all information. Uh, can this kind of halfway house essentially uh, be sustained with the king, for example, we've told he has cancer but not told what type of cancer, whereas in previous years the queen's uh, sort of mantra was never complain, never explain, and we didn't know really anything about her health. Well, of course, uh, one thinks back to the uh, 1930s and uh, George V was actually uh, finally, in fact, uh, died through a, a morphine injection so that it would be reported in the Times and not in the evening newspapers, which is quite extraordinary, but actually true. It's uh, then also, of course, the Queen's father, George VI, he was never told he had lung cancer, much less the public knowing. Yes, you're quite right. Uh, sometimes when the Queen, for example, in 2021, uh, when she was in hospital, uh, that was discovered by a journalist and uh, we didn't know. And Prince Philip was a most impatient patient at the best of times and he was a case in hospital and again uh, that was kept private it's a, it is a difficult balance as head of state I mean King Charles of course uh, this is the what is so extraordinary about this this whole um, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, very very sad business uh, he undergoing treatment for cancer is making sure that we see since he is head of state uh, when he's carrying on with uh, his uh, uh, 
basic duties, but obviously cannot do royal engagements. And again, looking forward, we simply don't know when certain royal engagements will take place with the king or, or with Catherine, or indeed um, when they could be expected to go abroad. So it's an absolute yeah. nightmare for royal planners. Nothing like this has happened previously. So it, it, it is an extremely sensitive area regarding this specific type of cancer. I think we know quite enough. I think that broadcast uh, was uh, gave a balance and, and laid down the marker that yes. Catherine, in future, she wants time and space, echoes of Diana's famous statement there, and also privacy. And I think that uh, that will be roughly where it will be left. Well, let, let, let's hope so, and let's hope that she is back on her feet and uh, uh, full, fully recovered and able to take out to, uh, to be able to carry out the engagements that she wants to. Richard Fitzwilliams, Royal Commentator, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Um, Don has been in touch on messages. He says, Hi Peter, the health issues of the Royal, the update of the English flag on football shirts on our brutal social media all conspire to depress our spirit, says Don. Um, one person's message here, no name. I had to tell my eight-year-old daughter I had a brain tumour back in 2010 after I'd had surgery to remove it. Kate is so brave sharing her diagnosis whilst prioritising her children. She is a mummy before a princess like the rest of us. Um, Paul says, I have nothing else to say other than God bless you, Princess of Wales, and your family and all um, suffering uh, this treatment, says Paul West, and so thank you to him. A few messages on the flag as well, the controversy over the St George's flag being tampered with on the uh, England football kits. Penny in Essex says, Peter, I'm appalled that Nike have had the brass neck to mess with our St George's flag. Would they have done this with America's stars and stripes? I reckon they know that anyone can do anything to England who will put up with it. I'm sure they, I'm sure had they done this to the Irish, Scottish and Welsh flags, there would have been riots. The footballers should refuse to wear this awful strip and revert to the old one. Once Nike find no one is buying it, that will be that. So easy, but no one seems to see it. We have a neighbour who puts up his flagpole proudly flying our St George's flag on St George's Day. I love to see it proudly flying. Jonathan List deserves a slap for his comment. Well, we can't advocate that. Uh, we have nothing to be proud of. Don't take away our flag, says Penny from Essex. Uh, Amanda says, another step in the slow authoritarian march of the woke agenda. Now they've come for our flag. Utterly disgraceful. Stephen says, if Jonathan Less doesn't, who was our commentator a little bit earlier on, about half an hour ago, doesn't understand the issue with the flag, then no explanation will ever convince him of how much this matters to those who have and want the identity of being English. Maybe that's part of the problem today, a lack of positive fixed identity. Stephen, I think I agree with you. We need a positive uh, Britishness. We need a positive identity. We need to know what that means rather than these sort of vague concepts and the people who would attack our Britishness um, need to know what the positive bits of it are. Paul in Cornwall says, Peter, the St George's flag is the England football team's trademark. Try messing with the Nike swoosh trademark. See how long it takes for them to set their lawyers on them. One more before the break from Someone, no name here, but it, it's a point worth addressing. Uh, this person says, I'm a little disappointed with Talk TV today. Princess Catherine has come out to give personal details about her condition and how social media and online bullies have pressured her to do this by spreading speculative stories. Now you have an oncologist on discussing her situation and uh, speculating details of her illness. No real difference to the online trolls. It's good some symptoms were discussed for education for the public, but not anywhere near enough. I'm going to respectfully disagree with that. I think that the fact we did have an oncologist on is really important because I think people, that, that, you know, Princess Kate has made this broadcast. It will raise awareness of cancer, certainly. And yeah, we are taking a real look at ourselves today in terms of how this was reported and speculated upon, yes, by people online, but also by journalists as well. We're also going to talk um, to someone in just a minute whose husband was an MP. He had cancer. I knew him very, very well because I worked for him. And how she, Cathy Brokenshire, protected her children. Stay with us next here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the Statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, to put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, I used to work, as you may know, as a special advisor in government for three and a half years. And for about three of those years, I worked with a brilliant man, great man, uh, best boss I've ever had, uh, called James Broken Now, James is no longer with us. He died of lung cancer in 2021. And it was interesting because I was managing his media at the time. And part of that was uh, part of the time I was working with him, part of the time I wasn't working with him. When he had cancer, it went away. Then it came back. But one person I got to know very well, not just because I was working with James, and um, who I now uh, consider a very, very close friend, is Kathy, his wife, Kathy Brokenshire, who joins me now. And I just, I was chatting to Kathy on uh, WhatsApp last night, as we often do. We met up last week, and I was just thinking, actually, hold on a second. In terms of pub someone who's public facing, yes, James was a politician. He was a cabinet minister. He was Northern Ireland secretary, housing secretary. He he wasn't as well known, of course, as one of the most famous women in the world. Princess Kate. But nonetheless, it was very, very, very public when he had the very personal aspect of having cancer being diagnosed uh, a couple of times with it. So Cathy's with me now, and I'm really glad that she's agreed to do this interview. Cathy, thanks for joining me this morning. Not at all. Morning. Um, I suppose the, the, the question I have is for you as uh, James is, you know, ran his life, basically, and were his uh, yeah. wonderful, wonderful wife, mother of his three brilliant kids. Um, you were someone who had to deal with this as well. It wasn't something that you'd asked for at all. You'd made a decision together for James to go into politics. But then people sort of thought they knew him, but actually they didn't. And then there were people who really did know him who wanted to be nice about it. But presumably the public eye aspect of this actually adds another layer of stress and worry in regard to, uh, you know, this horrible diagnosis. Yeah, totally. It's It's... You know, you get that shocking diagnosis, um, and you, you, you. First of all, you have a whole round of tests, and then you have to go home and wait for all the results to come through. Uh, and for us, we went off to the hospital to find out those said results. And um, because James was Northern Ireland secretary at the time, he had police officers and protection. Um, so we were driven up to the hospital, went in to see the oncologist who was told the devastating news that yes, he had lung cancer. However, um, it was going to be treatable and what 
the prognosis were and the course of action. Um, and we walked out of that consultation uh, and immediately outside the door were protection officers to escort us out of the building and take us home. Um, so we then sat in a car um, for an hour, um, not really being able to actually discuss that news um, and, and obviously in shock. We then actually had to then go and do the school run. Um, and because it wasn't time for to be dropped, James to be dropped home, we actually did that again with the protection officers and collected up all the three kids um, and then came home. And it was a normal evening of, you know, school, homework, catching up with whatever had happened um, in the day for James work-wise um, and for me doing teas and whatever and dealing with the kids. And it wasn't until about eight, nine o'clock in the evening that we finally had a couple time to sit down and actually process and discuss what we had been told. Um, so it, yeah, um, that was difficult in itself. And then obviously because of James and his role and, and the situation that was happening over in Northern Ireland at the time. I should say it was, um, it was quite a tricky time in terms of talks that were going on, another political crisis in Northern Ireland. And, and at one stage, actually, people were asking me, where, where is he? Why is he not in Northern Ireland? And, and actually he was receiving treatment. Yeah, um, and we then had to actually tell the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, um, James's condition and his news before we actually told the wider family um, because of the situation and the circumstances. Uh, that, that's such a weird position to be in, yeah. Cathy, where you're telling the Prime Minister of the country, James's boss essentially at the time, before yeah. you're before you're telling the wider. I mean, that that sort of sequencing of events, that that I who you tell when, and then of course going, it went from being very private to very very public. What was that like? Yeah. That just that bit. What was that like for you? Um, it it was difficult. I mean, as I say, my main protection was. Uh, my concern was to protect the kids, um, um, and we we are we were a very close family of five. I now have an incredibly close family of four, obviously because James has sadly passed away. Um, and you're trying to process stuff, um, and it's just simple things. James was in the public eye, um, and you'd want to walk out the door. And obviously, James, it's well publicised he had lung cancer, and part of his treatment is exercise and being healthy and walking. So we'd go out and walk outside the front door. Um, the sun was shining. Um, it's a way of relaxing for most people, listening to nature, the birds, looking at the scenery. Um, and because we're living in the community that James represented, people would come up and ask questions and ask how he was. But obviously what they hadn't realised is three minutes before on a different street, mm. we'd been asked the same question. You might pop out for an hour's walk and I'll be asked five, six, seven uh, times, and that, how are you? And that comes from a that comes from a really good place, Kathy, doesn't it? Those people totally. want to be nice, and I'm sure you know we've already seen all the well wishers on social media. Princess Kate will be getting thousands of cards and messages and so on. She has people to to deal with that. She has a correspondence unit and people yeah. to protect her from that. But and and you had a couple of people around you, but really at, at, at the time because it was so public, that was must have been pretty intrusive for you as well. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the publicity creeps up on you with the job anyhow. Um, so you're kind of used to being in the public eye. We never expected that James would have lung cancer because he was a never smoker. Uh, and it, it does add another layer of dement uh, sort of another layer that other mm. people just don't have to deal with. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you can't change that. You just have to deal with it. Um, James then obviously quickly realised that he could try and harness this and use it for good. I mean, we, we were inundated, as I'm sure Princess Catherine will be, and, and the King, actually, with letters and, well, you know, well, good wishes and what have you. Um, and, and that gives you strength in itself. And you hear other stories of people that have been through similar situations. And again, you know that you're not alone. Um, and th those James were actually the words. Those were actually the words that that uh, Princess Kate used herself. You are not alone. I wonder. You I mean you talked about protecting your kids, but what what sort of steps did you take to protect your kids uh, when this was all happening? You'd obviously had to protect them in many ways previously because people make all sorts of assumptions about children of politicians and so on. That's a whole thing in itself. But actually, when the illness is there, what did what did you do to protect your children? The, uh, ultimately. 
you know, you have to be honest. Uh, I mean, for us, it was being honest with the children and explaining si the situation. Um, and it, you know, it was incredibly hard. It will be incredibly hard for any family that is going through a cancer diagnosis. It's going to be one in two people these days, which actually then means when you take the wider family, whether it's your son, your mother, your daughter, your cousin, your aunt, it's most probably every family is impacted with cancer. Um, and for us, trying to protect the children was being honest with them. Um, and, and therefore, because it was in the public eye, if somebody came up to them and talked to them and asked them questions, it didn't come as a shock. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, every family navigates it in their own way and what they think is best. Um, as I say, for James, when he realised and he realised the outpouring, he knew that he could try and harness this and, and raise awareness. Um, and that's kind of what I've been doing ever since he's passed away. It's for me, I find comfort in the fact that if I can help another family that's going through this, whether they're in the public eye or not, uh, and it and, and in, in turn help save lives. And that's what um, you've done, Cathy. That. That's what you've done with the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. Tell us about your work with them. Yeah, I've now become an ambassador and a trustee for Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation, which I have found massively rewarding. And I've actually come across people that have seen me do interviews in the past where I'm talking about symptoms uh, and awareness, uh, and they've then gone and seek help with a doctor. Uh, and they basically have been sadly diagnosed with lung cancer and they wouldn't be alive today had they not heard my words, uh, which is so rewarding uh, and it just inspires you to keep going. And as I say, I mean, Kate, we don't know what type of cancer she's got, um, but there are so many generic symptoms of various cancers and that's whether it's the fatigue, it's the loss of weight, something not feeling right, um, and it's it's not only you yourself recognising that. I mean, we spend a lot of time with our work colleagues. We spend time with our friends. And if somebody just mentions, I'm not feeling well, or you notice that they, there's something different about them and it's something that you're happy to talk about and it's been going on for three weeks or more, I just urge anyone to go seek help because early diagnosis is the key and, and the prognosis can be completely different. Um, if you get that early diagnosis. It's great work, Cathy. And just finally, uh, before you go, I know from one Catherine to another, uh, there is uh, something, when, when, when you're Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, there's a lot of sacrifices you make. It's a very unpopular job. You, it's a very difficult Northern Ireland. Uh, politics is very tricky. You make a lot of enemies. A lot of people don't like you very quickly, although James was almost universally loved even by his political so-called enemies. But there's something, there's, there's a great bit about being Northern Ireland Secretary that you get and Princess Kate has access to it too and I know you want to give her just a little pointer on this front of a little bit I, of a bit of, bit of an idea of somewhere where which might be nice to go. I would never be on a position to recommend a royal what to do however I have been privileged and lucky enough to stay at Hillsborough Castle which is a royal palace um, I would strongly recommend if um, Princess Kate and Prince William and their family can go to Hillsborough Castle and stay there. James and I found solitude in walking in the gardens. There is something magical about that place. And I know the current king uh, is very fond of Hillsborough Castle. So that would be my bit of advice. If she can get, take time out and has the space to go, I recommend her to go visit Hillsborough Castle and stay there. Definitely. Excellent. Members of the public can go in as well. I spent lots of time in the in Thanks. the gardens there. Kathy, thank you very much. Thanks for speaking so Not honestly and openly to us. You're a great friend and I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Kathy Brokenshire there, whose husband James Brokenshire, MP, was a Conservative MP who had lung cancer and very sadly died in 2021. Well, thank you to Trisha who's been in touch. She says, hi, Peter. Great shock to hear about the Princess of Wales. I'm full of admiration for how dignified she was delivering her message. At the age of 50, I had colorectal cancer, which was diagnosed post-op as stage three. I then had six months of chemotherapy in 1998. And thankfully, I'm still here 26 years later. I like Catherine. Uh, I, like Catherine, had amazing care and wonderful family support. I know she will make a complete recovery, 
best wishes to Catherine and her lovely family, says Tricia. What a lovely message, Tricia. We wish you well as well. And Martin has been, is, uh, been waiting patiently. He's in Isleworth in West London. Thank you for giving me a call on 0344 499 1000. Martin, you're on the air. What would you like to say about this? Well, just basically two brief points. First of all, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that increasingly uh, people recover from cancer. Yeah. Um, and that there's been an awful lot of doom and gloom in the, uh, the various headlines. Um, but, I mean, speaking for myself, I had surgery in 2021 um, and then followed by chemotherapy, which was the worst part. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been clear ever since. You're fighting fit these days, Martin. Well, yes, indeed. As I say, the worst thing was the side effects of the chemotherapy where everything tastes like cardboard for six months. Um, but that's not much of a price to pay for your continued existence. Well, indeed. Well, we wish you well, Martin, and, and a good, good couple of reminders there. There is hope, and certainly, as uh, the Princess of Wales said, to any cancer sufferer, or indeed their families and friends, you are not alone. So thank you to Martin there. If you want to get in touch, it's 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Uh, we're going to talk about potholes next because they're an increasing problem. Everybody, uh, I'm sure, has seen them in various parts of their, uh, their where they live and, and nearby. And uh, what can really be done about them? What should be done about them? Because local councils are under a huge amount of pressure. We'll debate that next here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On flags, John has been in touch and says, Peter, can you imagine if they put a trickler, an Irish trickler, onto the uh, Northern Ireland top, all hell would break loose? Well, I think it'd be wiser than to do that. But there was a tweet that went out from the number 10 official 
uh, Twitter account which had was talking about Northern Ireland and had the Irish flag on it. That was a few months ago and it caused a bit of controversy. It's always good to know which uh, parts of the world you're actually in control of in the United Kingdom, but apparently Town 10 Downing Street didn't know that. Um, Louise says, Peter, please, you're discussing uh, Princess Catherine, not Kate. She herself does not like being referred to as Kate. Some courtesy, please. Well... I don't think it's being discourteous to call her Kate. I mean, she was known as Kate Middleton. That was her name. And it's funny, actually, because when I was growing up, I remember a lot of people who would refer to Diana Spencer. And I kind of thought, why don't you just say Princess Diana? But actually, I mean, when something's embedded in, in the public's mind, um, that's that's maybe part of it. I don't think it's disrespectful, to be honest, uh, Louise. And I think people do call her Princess Kate or Kate Middleton or whatever. Um, I think there are lots of other ways she's been disrespected in the last little while, so I respectfully disagree with that. Sue says there are millions of people who do not follow social media trolls, but do follow mainstream media who are the drivers of the stories they publish, so they also need to stop incessant coverage about the princess's health. The media never seem to accept responsibility for anything, precisely why the Sussexes ran for the hills. Sue, I'm going to put that exact point to Afu Hagen, who's coming on soon, but now I want to talk about potholes, and one texter's been in touch to say, I did a wheel on my car when I went down a pothole. I checked because see no damage had no idea until it went in for its service when they sent me a video of the inside of my wheel it was all twisted they said it was dangerous i'd been driving on it for weeks with nothing noticeably wrong then we went to the azores the roads were unbelievably brilliant which were when they were then in the eu we paid for say no more says penny well potholes are a massive massive issue and i do wonder actually if there's a political party that said we're going to fill them all in we're going to sort this out well actually maybe they would get elected gary schofield is from the asphalt industry alliance and uh, he has found that more than half of the local road network in england and wales could fail in the next 15 years that they might need to fix the backlog of repairs 16.3 billion quid uh, Gary, I'm sure you wouldn't mind if some of that 16.3 billion quid went to the Asphalt uh, uh, Industry Alliance. But nonetheless, joking aside, this is a massive, massive problem and it's not going to go away. You're absolutely right, Peter. And uh, this is the 29th year of the so-called alarm survey. Uh, this is a survey which is sent out to the local authorities and they comment on the state of their roads. And you're absolutely right. It's been It's been declining each of those 29 years and we're now at this state where we have this horrendous figure of 16.3 billion pounds as a one-off cost and as you quite rightly say more than half of the roads in the uk that's 107,000 miles of roads are likely to be failing in the next 15 years and really the only thing we can say is that we, we need increasing investment and we need an increasing vision for the local authorities of the budgets they're likely to get in the uh, in the next five years. Um, this is a, a, one of the issues that really, really annoys drivers. Most, uh, not that you know it from a lot of the London-centric media, but the majority of journeys that are made in this country are made by car. If you are making a journey by public transport, it's likely to be on the bus. So most people use their cars most of the time to get to work, to go around, to pick up their kids, whatever people do, visit friends, whatever they do. And it is one of those massive bugbears, isn't it? Where you just think, why can't councils just fill in the potholes? I mean, it, it's, so, it's so basic, yet it's complex as well, isn't it? Yeah, and the real problem is that filling in the potholes isn't the answer. The answer is to get to the roads, maintain the roads, to avoid the potholes coming in the first place. What, what causes potholes? Well, what causes them is the fact that water gets into the structure of the road and then it, there's two main factors then which happen. First of all, there's the freeze-thaw cycle where, of course, when water freezes, it expands and so it disrupts the road. But the other thing is, of course, when you've got traffic driving over a road which has water on it, the tyres create a huge water pressure which effectively acts like a, like a water jet which, which uh, strips, the, uh, strips the bitumen off the uh, aggregate in the road and that causes the problems. So it's critically important that we maintain the roads and keep water out of the structure. Um, I, I just want, if you'll stay where you are, um, Gary, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to bring a caller in here, Chris from the West Midlands, who has a story to tell on potholes. Chris, you're very welcome uh, to the programme. You're on with me, and I think Gary is listening to you as well, Gary Schofield from the Asphalt Industry Alliance. Uh, what's your thought on potholes, Chris? OK, uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, good morning to you, Pete. Good morning. Now, um, to begin with, the councils are not 
I could put it. They, they, as, as Gary just said, they're not maintaining the, the roads properly, but equally, they're not employing the right highway engineers anymore. Why is that? And, well, this is, a, this is a, the crux of the matter. You've got the guys going around and they're just putting the yellow lines down, but they're not looking carefully at what they're doing. Then on the second point, the, the, the gangs that the, the councils used to have, they used to have these, like, two gangs that would go out repairing potholes and doing them properly. How, how do you know all this, Chris? Were you maybe part of one of those or did you, did you do I this? Worked, I worked on the roads. Ah, OK. So you knew all about potholes then. The 70s, 80s and 90s. Well, what, what needs to be done, Chris? What, what, how could, how could well, this be solved in your mind, do you think? First off... I'm going to say this, it needs one to bring back the jackhammers. But what they're doing, they're cutting the joints with a saw. That creates a dust. That then gets wet, and the, the, the new material can't bind properly to the edges, so the edges break away, and the pothole comes back out again. Mm. This is what's happening. They also need to bring back using bitumen and not this uh, emulsion on the joints as well. And this, this is another uh, crux of the matter, which Gary just more or less mentioned. When you put the bitumen on, hot, it used to seal the joint properly and seal into it. Then they're using emulsion now, and they're also using a cheaper emulsion as a, uh, a, a binder and not use what we used to call tack coat. OK, you, you get, you're getting into quite a lot of technical detail here, Chris, but there, there are clear, clear issues that you've, you've made there. I just want to put that to Gary. I mean, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot in that, isn't there, uh, Gary, in terms of how uh, the, the methods have changed over the years in terms of dealing with potholes? Uh, there, there's many, many techniques now that are around to, uh, to address potholes. Uh, but as I said previously, the real effect is that it, while, while we're dealing with potholes, all we're doing is sticking a plaster over the main problem. And in many respects, if you consider it like a flood, what we're doing is buying the residents buckets to bail out the houses. We really need to be attacking the source of the flooding. And likewise, with the roads, we need to be attacking the source of the problems. Rather than treating the symptoms, mm -hmm. we need to be treating the problems. I, I, I want to put a few messages to you, um, Gary, because we've had quite a few people being in touch about this. Jane says, hi, Peter. Perhaps the potholes could be fixed if money wasn't wasted on non-essential projects. Amanda says, perhaps if the local councillors stopped paying themselves extortionate salaries and living the high life, they would spend our money on escalating priorities. Maureen says lots of roadways are continually being dug up to replace pipes and cables. No wonder roads are potholed. I mean, all of this comes into it, especially um, that issue of local government finance, how much, how much money councils have. We can talk about them wasting money and having uh, the wrong priorities and so on. And actually, there is a real frustration, which I think that a number of our texters have expressed there, mm -hmm. about the fact that this is just a really, really basic thing. Yet, as you correctly point out, Gary, it's totally out of control. And there's many points there which you could pick up on, uh, but the, the key factor is the funding element and the, the amount of money the local authorities have got. We hear from the uh, this promise from the government that the money left over from HS2, this 8.3 billion, is going to be invested in the roads, and that's obviously welcome news. The only problem is, of course, that that 8.3 billion is spread over 10 years which translates to really a, what is a, a drop in the ocean of what's required. It's a positive move, don't get me wrong. But I think after the, after the next election, whoever owns the purse strings must really honour that commitment, but they must also build on it. Because the reality is the government said that that 8.3 billion is enough to pave 5,000 miles of road. But the reality is we've got 107,000 miles of road which are likely to be failing over the next 15 years. Mm. So, you know, the scale of the investment is critically important. Um, and also, sorry, the, the other point is that it's also the uh, budgeting mechanism mm. that's in play because whilst the local authorities get annualised budgets, that doesn't allow them to plan. They really need a five-year rolling budget so that they can see what monies they've got so they can optimise the value they get out of the money that they're spending.
Um, Linda says, just a thought, why not use all the tarmac used for making speed bumps to fill in the potholes instead? Carl Jackson in Litchfield says, asphalt obviously isn't the answer. Use something else more appropriate. And actually, that's an a sentiment echoed by one texter who says, why, why, why not do concrete roads? I have one near me which has been there for 50 years. Would that work, Gary, or are you in league with big tarmac? No, I think the uh, the problem is with asphalt roads. Uh, the problem is with the uh, concrete roads. Sorry, is the uh, the, the the noise that they, they're not they're not um, infallible themselves. I think asphalt is definitely the way forward. But it, like anything, they need properly managing. They need properly maintaining. And unless we maintain those roads in a proper fashion, we're going to continue this this issue. And as I say, yep. this is the 29th year of the alarm survey, Goodness and we've me. seen that continual decline. Well, let's hope some progress is made. Gary, thank you. Gary Schofield there is from the Asphalt Industry Alliance. Chris is still on the line. Chris, what did you make of what uh, Gary was saying there? Well, let's get back to the concrete roads. Yeah, go for it. On the M54, it was made a hell of a lot of concrete. And... Uh, I mean, it would be 1991, 92. I went back uh, with uh, a, a firm there, and there was bringing all the concrete up and relaying it with asphalt. And I wanted to get onto asphalt. But first, let me tell you, the concrete swells and it breaks up. Right, so it's, it's not a perfect it's, one either. It does more damage to your tyres than what the asphalt does. Mm. OK. It breaks up. And it's harder to get up, so they got a company in to break it all up, and we went down and we relayed the uh, M54 back like a normal motorway. Yeah? Okay, yeah. yeah. Now, the second, the, the other part I wanted to mention, there's a lot... Of, Just briefly, Chris, about, if you would, because we're coming up to the yeah. break. Right, well, so a lot of the councils, as I say, they're not employing their own gangs anymore. Also, they're not laying enough asphalt roads on main roads. Asphalt is harder wearing than what they're putting down in the, the uh, 10 mil MTA, okay. which breaks up easier. Okay. Now, the MTA feels smoother and quieter, but the if you put down the asphalt properly, and Gary will tell you, it is good hard wearing material. It costs more, yeah. but there's less maintenance of it later. Yeah. I've learned, I've learned an awful lot from you, Chris, and from Gary. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks also to Don, who says, Peter, we have a monstrous pothole near us that destroyed my neighbour's front wheel and tyre. The council have put a traffic cone over it. Clearly, the problem has been solved. Uh, yes, uh, Don, I think there's a lot of frustration from a lot of people about all that. Let us know your pothole tales, 0344 499 1000, because it is so frustrating as motorists to deal with those, and there's so much that can be done, but the price, apparently, is £16.3 billion. We're going to talk more about Princess Kate now in a minute with the Royal Editor of The Sun. Stay with us here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Three, two, one. Uh, go, Graham. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh. Ooh. It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Well, a very good afternoon. I'm Peter Cardwell here on Talk TV between now and one. Nick Dubois will be here between one and four. I'll be back between ten and one, not just tomorrow, but also on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Julia Hartley Brewer is off on her holidays and I will be filling in for her Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday between ten and one. So for the next four days, I will be on your screens at this time. So thank you to everybody who's tuning in today and I hope you do so tomorrow and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Loads to discuss, including that very emotional video from Princess Catherine, the Princess of Wales, in regard to her uh, treatment, certainly for preventative treatment for cancer. We'll see, uh, we'll hear from some top royal commentators on that in a minute. We're also examining our own role, actually, as citizens, as on social media, as uh, journalists as well, in regard to this. Did we get carried away? There was so much online, especially speculation, which had absolutely no basis whatsoever. We'll also be talking this hour not just about Princess Catherine, but also about electric cars. Yesterday, I talked about electric cars on the Chinese, apparently, although it's been debunked by uh, one of the part, one person I was speaking to, saying that the Chinese could stop electric cars. But what about them more generally? Are there something that you want? Maybe you've bought one and have regretted that. Lee Davy is a vlogger, and I've been put in touch with him by a listener. So thank you for that to the listener who did that. And there's, you know, that, that's something I like on this programme. I like the story suggestions that come in from people. You can contact me on Twitter at Peter Cardwell through the week and we get our heads together, look at the best ones and do as much as we can on that. We knew, for example, potholes was something you wanted to talk about this week. We also have Tech Up Dave on the trail of the Loch Ness Monster. Has he found Nessie? We'll find out later. Uh, Dave has been lesser spotted in the last few weeks, but he's back on our screens uh, in a few minutes' time. So stay tuned for the Tech Up Dave um, update on whether he's found the Loch Ness Monster. There's a controversy about that, as there often is. I want your views as well. We have time for your calls between now and one as well. 0344 499 1000. You can text me 87222 with the word talk in your text. Tweet me, as I say, at uh, Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. You can also send a voice message or indeed a uh, text message on 0344 499 1000. That's on WhatsApp. And we're actually going to play our very first voice message from WhatsApp in just a few minutes' time. Lots to discuss here on Talk TV. Get yourself part of the conversation. 0344 499 1000. Stay with us for the next hour on Talk TV.
Well, I was discussing the Princess Catherine controversy with a number of friends last night on WhatsApp. I was talking to people, I was talking to people on the phone and various things. Obviously, a massive story which broke at about six o'clock last night. We were told, uh, often as a journalist, you're given an embargo. You're told something is coming, but you can't report it yet. Um, I, I, I found out about quarter past five, half past five, that you know something was coming. And we were pretty sure that it was to do with uh, Princess Catherine's health. So I was debating this with various friends and so on. And one friend said, do you know what, you've got to get Arthur Hagen on because of one angle that I hadn't really thought of, which my friend pointed out, which is a really good angle, which was to say, actually, hold on a second, does this actually justify Harry and Meghan leaving this country and Afu was 100% the person I wanted to talk to. We're also going to talk to Matt Wilkinson in a minute. He's the royal editor of The Sun. But Afu is here first. Uh, you're, I, I'm delighted you're on the programme, Afu. Thanks for taking the time today. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Peter? I'm very well, thanks. Um, Sue has been in touch and puts it really, really well, probably better than I could. Peter, mm -hmm. there are millions of people who do not follow social media trolls but do follow mainstream media who are the drivers of the stories they publish. So they also need to stop incessant coverage about the princess's health. The media never seem to accept responsibility for anything, precisely why the Sussexes ran for the hills. In all this controversy, and I'll ask you about the main points in a minute, but on that specific one, Afua, what do you think? I think actually that listener makes a very good point. If we look at how uh, the Princess of Wales has been written about over the past few weeks, how she's been talked about, you can kind of understand why people want to take themselves out of the goldfish bowl, while why they would say, you know what, enough is enough. We don't want to be written about incessantly. We don't want stories made up about us. We don't want to be the subject of gossip and ridicule. So we're just going to remove ourselves from the equation. And I think actually it does make a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. I can understand why the Sussex decided that America would be a better place for them, why they wanted to step back as working royals. If we look particularly at the Princess of Wales, you know, when she joined the royal family or even before she married Prince William, you know, she was written about very cruelly, weighty K and all that kind of stuff. And look at where we are now, a mother of three, a young mother of three, 42 years old, uh, that is now suffering with cancer. I would love if now we could step back and give her the time that she's requested to recover. But I do wonder why um, that same kind of grace wasn't afforded to the Sussexes before they left the royal family, why they were written about so cruelly, actually why any member of the royal family, Sarah Ferguson, you know, all the comments that were made about her weight, uh, you know, female members of the royal family, especially who marry into the royal family, really, really have to bear the brunt of bad press. There are people who will say, Afu, respectfully, that you and I are part of the problem, that we're talking about this today at, uh, you know, 12, 14, 16 hours after that uh, statement came out. And actually, we should now stop talking about it and leave her alone. I think this story will go away in a day or two. I think it's right to talk about it. And actually, we're raising awareness of it. She put the video out and uh, so on. But I wonder, was she forced to do so? And what about the role of the media, not just social media, but the media itself in all of this? I should point out there are good and bad journalists, there are good and bad yeah. shop assistants, there are good and bad GPs, there are good and bad princesses, and not everybody's yeah. the same. And I know you're someone with a lot of integrity, Afia. But we, we do have a role to play, don't we? We do have a role to play. And actually, uh, that question is a good one. You know, why are we still talking about it? At the end of the day, the royal family are news. You know, they are taxpayer funded. Uh, they are one of their members, you know, is the head of state. So we do talk about them. We will talk about them. I think you're right in saying in a day or two, this will absolutely have died down and we won't be talking about them much for a while. I hope anyway that we give, uh, especially the Waleses, the time and the space to process what is happening in terms of this cancer diagnosis. But the British media dove that does have a role to play. Social media does have a huge role to play as well. And yes, we have to take accountability. We do have to take accountability about what we talk about, about what we put out, about you know what conversations we have, what we stir up and what we don't. There's a lot to be said for that, absolutely. And on, and on that and point, I'm, Afua, I wonder mm -hmm. what you make of uh, Carol Decker, seems to be the first celebrity, the Tapao singer, who uh, has, has basically put an apology on Twitter just this morning. 
Last week I posted a tweet verify. Uh, sorry, last week I posted a tweet. Carol Decker says querying the validity of a video of Wills and Kate at the Windsor Farm Shop. I genuinely did not think it looked like them. I accept now it was genuine and did not mean to contribute to the unpleasant furore surrounding Kate's health. I have deleted it. Do you think this is the start of many public figures and presumably other people on social media saying, "Do you know what? Got it wrong. Sorry about that. Won't do it again." I think there's a certain uh, group of people, you know, Blake Lively has posted an apology today as well, who will realise the error of their ways and say, you know what, got caught up in the moment, got caught up in all the conspiracy theories, I'm going to apologise for my actions, I'm going to take accountability. But there is a certain section of people who are still carrying on down that road, and I've seen it today. You know, people that are are, are doubting the video of... Doubting the video? Yesterday. Really? Yeah. Yeah, there's people saying that that is fake, that the background's fake, oh, for that goodness shadow sake. here and this and that. Grow but up. this is the thing is, well, I couldn't agree with you more, mm. but this is the thing is there is a certain section of people who are just too far gone, who have decided that they can't trust anything that's being put out now because of the the snafu with the photograph sorry the photoshop picture on mother's day they've decided that they can't believe anything so i think there's kind of two camps now there's people who perhaps got caught up in it will say you know what i was wrong apologize and keep it moving but there's people who keep going down that road which i think is really unfortunate because you need to grow up and get a grip Afu Hagen, great uh, advice there and uh, great analysis. Thank you, Afu Hagen. There is a royal commentator. We're going to talk to the royal editor of The Sun, Matt Wilkinson, in a minute. But I just want to remind ourselves of that brave message that Princess Catherine put out yesterday evening. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This of course came as a huge shock and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment, but most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. Indeed, you are not alone. That is what uh, the key message, I think, that comes out of that. Matt Wilkinson is the royal editor of The Sun. Matt, thank you so much for joining me on Talk TV. Uh, it's been a dramatic 24 hours for uh, Princess Catherine. You've been a busy boy as well. How is The Sun covering this? Well, right from the very start, to be honest, we, we've shown a lot of respect, I think, and dignity to, to the Princess of Wales because, look, she, uh, you, your previous guest there talked about um, the Duchess of Sussex, as she, as she is, that, that she felt that she was kind of hounded out of the country. I mean, we treated the Princess of Wales with respect, um, contrast that to the abuse that she's received online. We've asked people to leave her alone. We've asked people to obviously, you know, stop bullying her because 
she is a woman who obviously was off with with needing you know um, abdominal surgery. Now we find out that is that actually cancer. And I just want to pick up like this 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 belief that you know people have been vicious towards her. A lot of the viciousness has actually come from the United States. A lot of it has actually come from Twitter handles connected to the so-called Sussex Squad. Um, we've had Stephen Colbert making jokes about her on American TV. We've had Kim Kardashian tweeting, maybe her media manager told her it was a good idea. It wasn't, that she was off to find Kate. And these are the kind of people, I'm, I'm glad that Carol Decker has apologised. I think I've just heard that for the first time. But or, um, people should be apologising. And I say, The Sun, uh, it, it is quite a contrast, really, that that the, the English media have actually perhaps been the good guys here. We have given her space, we have criticised the conspiracy theories, and we have represented her speech today as as a welcome speech, but also a, a dignified speech, contrasting it to the to the abuse that she's received on you know WhatsApp, meme, Twitter, uh, social media that has called it you know has, has called her into mm. has called her story into question. I do feel it's sad that she's had to make this. Um, actually had a wonderful statement to be honest when I first saw it yesterday I, I had to admit I was quite choked um to see her to, to you know to, to make that statement I think, in the way I think she we all were Matt it was it was, yeah. it was just extraordinary but uh, I mean it, it, it's come to this because in January through a spokesman she asked for privacy she asked for respect she asked for people to understand that she's going through major surgery she'll 13 days in hospital and she'll be back in April people didn't heed that the, the whole yeah. world you know, fell apart. People were like, well, where is Kate? And it descended into this mystery and they were filling the gaps. Can I actually and just the mention... The media have really, tried to, have really tried to pay respect to her and, 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 you know, now maybe she's actually said it, people might actually listen to her through her own words. I, I think that's a really good point, Matt. And I hope you don't mind me revealing details of a... Of, uh, harmless details, I should say, of a private conversation the two of us had. Uh, we both work in the same building. I saw you outside the building one day and said, what do you make of this? Where's Kate's speculation? And you said... It's nonsense. We know where she is. She's in Kensington Palace recovering from her illness. And that was just, you know, what I'm saying to viewers and listeners is that you, in public on this session and in private in that conversation, had a completely consistent line that she would was to be left alone. Yes, of course, you're doing your job as royal editor, you're reporting on her and so on. But it was a pretty shameful episode, actually, when there were so many people who were speculating without any shred of evidence on all sorts of wild and wonderful conspiracy theories. Do you think people will be chastened by that? We've seen Carol Decker, as you mentioned there, and others as well. But, but do you think people will maybe take a bit of a breath, take a beat and actually think, do you know what, maybe the next time something like this happens, we need to just have a bit more dignity and self-respect? Well, I hope so. Uh, I've got faith that people can apologise or people can actually turn around. But I think some people are just too far gone. I mean, after so I released the um, story on Monday that she'd been seen at the farmhouse, I uh, the farm shop. I knew that she'd been seen there. We then released the footage. Even then, I was getting abuse saying that this wasn't real. This is a fake video. Um, I, th I, I think it has been a shameful episode. I do think back to the era. It's hard to compare Kate with Diana, but I, I think back to the era when um, when Diana was hounded. And I think that, you know, a lot of journalists, a lot of newspapers um, did take stock and change their ways about the, the way they behaved with the celebrities and members of the royal family. And I hope that maybe some people with huge amounts of followers online, huge amounts of influence in the new kind of media space do actually follow the lead that happened in the 90s and maybe they change their behaviour. But because they are influencers, they do post things online that, that changes people's opinion mm -hmm. and people should maybe start looking to the newspapers, people who actually know what's actually going on that are reporting sensibly and respectfully and, and, and not, as I say, Kim Kardashian's tweet joking about trying to see Kate, which still riles me. I still think it's unfair that she did that. So hopefully there will be a change and people will take time after, you know, sit down, w watch that interview, see how hard it was for her to actually make that statement mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, have a little quiet word with themselves and not suddenly leap uh, to, to follow a, a conspiracy theory on social media or have a joke at a woman's expense. I mean, the people were joking at, at, at Kate's expense, asking where she where she was. Well, she was recovering, as she said, from a major yeah. surgery. She was undergoing chemotherapy and she was having to tell her three children and she's living her life in the spotlight. And it's people really need to, you know, I don't have a massive go at individuals, but they need to really have a word of themselves and maybe next time just, just pay a little bit of respect to people in the public eye. It's interesting you mentioned that point in regard to journalists knowing what they're talking about and not all not all of them do and we do of course you know there are good and bad journalists there are good and bad shop assistants there are good and bad GPs there are good and bad you know presenters of television programs but actually the one thing the media has uh, or parts of the media have is trust 
and if you trust a broadcaster, if you trust a journalist, or you trust a journalistic brand to tell you the truth about Princess mm -hmm. Kate and about other things as well. That's the key aspect, and to me, that's really all that differentiates uh, some media from you know someone on Twitter because they often have you know everybody has a smartphone, everybody everybody can be a citizen journalist sometimes, but actually that trust and getting your information from sources you trust and can trust to tell you the truth and be straight talking. That's so incredibly important, Matt, isn't it? It is. The media landscape is so disparate, if that is the world. We, we, we get news from all over the place now. You know, back in the day, you'd pick up a newspaper in the morning or you'd watch 6 o'clock news or 10 o'clock news and you'd talk about it at work the next day or school the next day. Now people are getting um, news, so-called facts, opinions or Twitter handles with, with, with so many followers from, from so many different avenues and, and they, they then think that they are armed with information that somebody else doesn't have yeah. and so you know as i say maybe th this could be the, the you know this could be the moment that ends the era of the conspiracy theory or let's the, hope so the let's hope control. so yeah matt yeah, thank you definitely. very very much indeed really appreciate you uh joining us today matt wilkinson is the royal editor of the sun uh joining us there so thank you to him oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand is the number not just a call but you can also send us a whatsapp message and uh, that's what one person has done this is the first time we've done this but someone has sent us a voice message uh, we've added it down a little bit it was a little bit long about 30 40 seconds is probably the right length um and uh, we're going to play this now it's about this issue and it's about uh, princess catherine and her uh, treatment preventative treatment for cancer so let's play this from uh, a viewer and listener um it's dreadful the diagnosis from Princess Catherine, instead of speculating and discussing and discussing and discussing something that's private and personal, why don't you have doctors saying a lot more about what we can do to try to prevent this dreadful disease, to prevent cancer? You read on the internet about different foods and you've got to eat lots of broccoli and this, that and the other and exercise and, and then contrasting the messages and you don't know what's right and you don't know what's wrong. You can't just go to your GP uh, you can hardly get a GP appointment these days. And that is uh, uh, the first voice message we ever played on this uh, programme from a uh, listener. Thank you very much indeed. And we did, I should say, we had Lawrence Young on earlier on at 11 o'clock. He's a professor of molecular oncology at Warwick University. So we're absolutely covering the medical angle of this as well. Uh, I want to take one more call about this and then I want to leave this story. We've covered it quite a lot today. But Janice is in London and has given me a ring on 0344 499 1000. Janice, thanks for the call. What would you like to say about this story? What I'd like to say is I'm disgusted with the English public that they want to invade a young woman's privacy. I think they've been absolutely disgusting. And I thought it was heartbreaking that she had to come out and speak when she's in that terrible condition to keep people quiet. I think the whole country should hang their heads in shame. Do you think she was forced to come out and do that video yesterday? No, I think she probably wanted to do it because she knew she had to do something. But it's a shameful state of affairs that a young woman that's suffering had to do that. I think it's disgusting. I, I, th I think a lot of people will feel the same way, Janice. What lessons do you think we can learn from this the next time something like this happens? A figure in the public eye saying, do you know, something's up. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Give me a bit of privacy. To be honest, I don't think we can ever do it because the country's gone into such a stupid condition now. And also, even if they know what's wrong with her, what can they do? They can't mm. help her. Well, and, and, and I'm sure the added stress of all the speculation hasn't helped her condition whatsoever. I'm not a medical expert, but it can't, it can't be a nice oh, thing. I think it's strange, but I think, as I say, I think the country should hang its head in shame. OK. Janice. I mean, we've got the king and we've got her. Prince William, I don't know how he puts one foot in front of the other. It must be awful for him with his father and his wife dealing with all of this. And he's got three little children. Yeah. Honestly, I'm shocked. And also, I'm speaking from experience because I've got cancer. I couldn't go out and speak now. Are you, are you, are you getting treatment for it, Janice? I'm just, I'm just in the middle of treatment, yes. Well, I wish you really, really well with that, Janice. Thank and you. I, I hope... And that's why I felt for her so much, yeah. because I thought if I had to get made up and go in front of a camera now, that would not be possible. How do you talk to your, to your friends and neighbours about it? Do you keep it pretty low-key, pretty quiet, or, or do you I feel... People... In fact, last week a friend of mine came round and tried to discuss it. I said, I won't talk about the royal family. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I mean your own, your own cancer. How do you? How do oh, you... I, I've just I've taken it. I've taken it. I'm 80 years old. I'm lucky to have got to this age. So I've, not, it... I've not made a fuss about it, to be honest. Yeah. 
well, Janice, we wish you really, really well. Keep in touch and thanks for the call. Really appreciate that. 0344 499 1000. We're going to leave this topic for the meantime. We've certainly covered it, uh, I think, from really all angles this morning. Uh, we'll maybe do a little bit on it tomorrow, but uh, we're not going to do it in, in as great depth. I think we've, we've, we've said what we want to say on it, and I will maybe take maybe one more call or something on it before the top of the hour, but um, I, I think we, we, we've basically covered it. So we're going to talk about electric cars next. It was interesting, I was covering for Ian Collins yesterday on his programme between 3 and 4, and I should say I'm covering for Julia Hartley Brewer between 10 and 1 Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. So you'll have quite a lot of Cardi P in your life uh, if you're uh, watching between the hours of 10 and 1, both tomorrow, usual show on Sunday, and uh, covering for Julia Hartley Brewer Monday, Tuesday and, and Wednesday. But someone got in touch and said, you talked about electric cars, you talked about China, and uh, actually there's a lot more that you want to, that you should be talking about on this. So I thought, right, okay, let's do that. So we're going to talk to a vlogger called Lee Davey, who I've been put in touch with by a very nice listener called Jason, who says he's the man to talk to in all of this. So uh, we'll talk to Lee in just a minute about electric cars and whether China, whether we should worry about China's rule in them. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, thank you to everybody who has been in touch on this. Uh, Jane says, Hi Peter, the problem for a long time uh, is that many people don't trust the broadcast media. How many times on your uh, show do the audience mention they don't trust the BBC, don't watch it? Therefore, they look for an alternative. The truth is something you see with your own eyes, says Jane. So thank you for texting in, Jane. Uh, Sally in Surrey says, It can take weeks, literally weeks, to come to terms with a cancer diagnosis for both the sufferer and their nearest and dearest. I find it heartbreaking watching that valiant young woman addressing millions of people when she 
she uh, surely still staggering under the shock of her own diagnosis. Peter, my husband has come to the end of his treatment and my darling sister just started her own journey. Let me tell you, cancer treatment is not for sissies. Great show as always. Best, uh, best love, says Sally in Surrey. Thank you, Sally. We wish you and your family all the very, very best with the battles ahead. Thank you to Karen on the Cathy Brokenshire, uh, who was on, and uh, James, her husband, was my MP, says Karen. He had the same surgeon as my aunt, who also never smoked, and he had lung cancer too. James was a great MP, so sad what happened to him. He was so helpful to me. My aunt died too. Lots on um, potholes as well. Uh, one person says 100% of road tax was originally used to maintain roads. Now it all goes into central government. Only 25% is used for road maintenance. Not surprising we have a pothole problem. Cedric says, Peter, regarding potholes, surely the utility services have a lot to answer for. Where I live in South End, the roads are atrocious. Where the utilities have uh, just gone for a quick fix and within weeks the surfaces are sh starting to shrink down. Call from Harrogate says the eco-warriors that love to ruin our lives are constantly lobbying government and councils to not spend money on roads as they believe eventually people will give up driving and the planet will be saved in their deluded minds. Uh, Kim Knappman says tarmac roads have a minimum of two layers. The top layer is called a wearing course designed to wear out and be less costly to replace rather than replace the whole road structure. Concrete roads are noisy, says Kim. I'm learning a lot about roads today and potholes. Uh, N says there are quick they are quick enough to resurface roads when there has been a diesel spillage after a lorry accident. Easy solution, just go and tip diesel on the roads with potholes. They'll be repaired that day. I am absolutely not advocating that people do that. Uh, I would imagine N has his or her tongue firmly in cheek. Thank you also on uh, Twitter. Quite a lot of people getting in touch. Ruby Redhead says, Peter Catherine is a 42-year-old woman, not a child. She owned her illness and is treating it as any adult would. William loves his wife and respects her enough to let her decide how she wants to proceed as any loving husband would. He has to allow her to decide, says Ruby Redhead. Thank you for that. Thanks also to Susan who says, I'm not much of a royalist, but I don't know what the alternative would be. I certainly wouldn't want a presidential system. I think that the Princess of Wales has done a great job since her marriage and seems to be a genuinely nice person who deserves to be treated with respect. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. Electric cars is an issue that I was discussing yesterday. I was filling in for Ian Collins between three and four yesterday, and I just thought there's so much more to discuss. There, uh, The person I was speaking to, our technology correspondent, Will Guyatt, was saying that actually the ability of Beijing, China, uh, to remotely control uh, electric vehicles is overblown. We need to be less worried about it. Um, but listen, there are... Uh, lots of discussions about that, about electric vehicles in general. And one man who's been recommended to me by a trusted uh, viewer and listener, a guy called Jason, who sometimes contacts me with ideas. And you can do the same thing, by the way. You can contact me on Twitter, as many people do. Lee Davy is a vlogger and uh, knows all about electric cars and indeed has had one himself. Lee, it's great to have you on the programme. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very well, thanks. You have had a bit of a story with your electric car, which was a little bit on the pricey side and now perhaps not worth quite so much. Uh, it was £120,000. That's a um, lot of money for a car, Lee. <laughs> but now it's worth about, well, uh, it's worth less than the battery, a replacement battery for it. And a replacement battery for it is £45,000. Uh, plus um, labour, so that's quite costly. So obviously, I better not write the car off uh, or have an accident because um, it'll be written off, basically. So, uh, yeah, it's not good at all, and we're not being told all these downfalls. Uh, well, what should we cars. be told about electric vehicles? Because there's, so there's so much sort of uh, information about them, people saying electric vehicles are the way forward, charge your electric vehicle, and some people really like them. And I've, I've been in a number of electric vehicles. The acceleration is generally pretty good, but a lot of people worried about the, the longevity of them, the fact that, you know, in your case, for example, the depreciation has been uh, pretty crazy in that regard and the replacement of the battery. So what are those sort of main issues uh, that you would have with electric vehicles, Lee? Well, the main issue to start with, I will say, by the way, we're being told to uh, purchase electric vehicles rather than uh, an equivalent diesel or petrol car. Um, but we're being told this by the governments, etc., who are still driving, by the way, if you look, they're still driving their V8 Range Rovers, etc., and not driving uh, electric cars themselves. So they're actually not practicing what they preach. They're not also telling us the downfalls of electric cars which is, of course, the depreciation and also, more importantly, the infrastructure. For instance, I did a video where I was travelling from uh, John O'Groats to Land's End 
um, and I called up at one of the charging points, I had to unplug my car because there wasn't enough power to the grid to actually charge all four cars that, that was on that That's charging, totally that unsustainable. That's totally... I mean, and, and there is this anxiety, isn't there? About re, what do they call it? Range anxiety, is that right? About, about how far your car will actually go. Range anxiety is real. Uh, and also the issue you've got, which I've found out numerous times on these journeys that I do, you get to a charging point and then you're, you're in a queue. You're waiting for yep. it. So you spend half your time waiting around. Now, I'm not saying electric cars don't have a place in society, but I'm, what I'm saying is they actually not for everybody we should be given a choice for if you want to potter around to the shops then get a small electric car it's great but to put a, a, a proper car there with an electric uh, motor in it they're not they're not fit for purpose let me, let me I, I basically agree with you lee but let me play devil's advocate here because as we've seen with phones for example you know the batteries are going to get a lot better the technology is going to get better the uh the weight of of the cars and of the batteries is going to get lower technology will increase and you'll have to charge them less they'll go further i mean this is really the early stages of electric cars isn't it i mean the technology will just increase and develop to such a degree so maybe as time goes on things will get better i see what you're saying but we've been promised better batteries for many many years and these products these cars these vehicles are disposable cars mm. you, you go to look at some classic cars from many many years ago they're still driving around I can guarantee you that you look at my Porsche Taycan, for instance, in five, ten years, that won't be around. It's like a phone. You haven't got your original phone. You probably haven't got your phone from three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. But And they're telling us that they're better for the environment. Is it not better for the environment to get a car and keep it until the wheels fall off, basically? Yeah. Um, these, thing, these things are disposable items, and uh, they will never, ever work you imagine everybody on the planet has an electric car and the amount of minerals that they've got to dig up for these electric cars often very unethically up. involving child labor and often uh, and often you know from dubious sources and also where do they go afterwards and also where does the only electricity come from i mean surely you're going to have to create loads and loads and loads of electricity to deal with to deal with this the infrastructure i mean the list goes on doesn't it lee it goes on and on. There's lots of drawbacks to it. I believe also that we're, this is my opinion. I believe that ultimately, I don't think that the governments and the powers that be, I've said this before, want us to drive at all. They're going to push us all into these electric vehicles. It's all ultimately about control and controlling us. And I think the motor manufacturers are being pushed into a corner. I don't even believe that they want to be producing electric cars, but they've got no choice. Because if they don't, come 2035, they're not going to have a business. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting point. Um, we've got a question from Tech Op Dave, who's uh, my wonderful sort of sidekick, who uh, is, knows a lot about electric cars and indeed I think has one or had one previously. No, no, he doesn't like them. Um, but he knows, he knows all about them anyway. Not as much as you, Lee, but a lot anyway. As electric cars are heavier than normal cars, are they making potholes worse? We've been talking about potholes quite a lot. Um, and we know that they're heavier and we know that these batteries have sometimes caught fire on different uh, ships, container ships and so on. Is the, is the pothole aspect of this? and an issue just tying together uh, some of the driving stories that we've had today well you could argue the fact that these these well they are heavier these cars are heavier and for the past two to three years or whatever it is we've also not been paying road tax so that's not really it's not really correct is it so but that comes into force again and i said this when i first got my electric car everyone was like oh but you don't pay road tax you don't mm. pay congestion charges but I can tell Ulez, you this now, yeah. you, ULEZ, because I can go into London with my car, I don't have to pay ULEZ, I don't have to pay congestion charges. However, once everybody has got an electric car, then they'll change the ULEZ to pay by mile, and that's what's coming in, but they can't see it. People are blinkered by it because they're listening to what the governments are telling us. But look, and I'll go back to what I said earlier on, and I'll say it again, why aren't all the powers that be, why aren't, why aren't the prime ministers and the presidents driving electric cars themselves? They're not. They're telling us to drive them, but they're not driving it. Mm. And they're saying that they're better for the environment, yet they fly off on jets to climate conferences, etc. It doesn't make any sense. I think the sooner people wake up 
the better. You've got people who watch my videos on electric cars. The electric car people, I call them evangelists because they are really, really, they like they religiously love their electric cars. And you've also got a separate uh, different uh, people in there who have Teslas as well. Everybody keeps saying you should get a Tesla. Why would I want? Uh, it, it's absolutely beyond belief, honestly. Um, Cliff and Berkshire has got in touch. He says, please ask Lee about electric vehicle safety on ferries. Do they pose a serious fire risk? Well, we've seen some of the evidence of that, certainly, but are those just isolated cases? Well, it seems to be on a lot of news stories. I'm just saying this. Every time there's an electric vehicle fire, it seems to be a diesel that's at issue, that's at fault for some reason. I think there's a lot of... Um, false news out there and false information about uh, electric vehicles and it's being pushed so that everything's on a positive side. I've been warned off to stop making my YouTube videos about electric cars by certain people. I've had emails saying that, <laughs> that I better not make any more videos about these cars or negative things about electric cars. It is literally, it's an, it's an agenda and the sooner, to, the sooner people wake up, the better. I, I, I have had my electric car now for two and a half years, and I can tell you, they will never, ever work. Anything with batteries, we all know, anything that's got batteries in it uh, is, is rubbish, basically. It's, you haven't got. Electric, electrical items are disposable. You've got the dangers behind it as well. And have people actually looked into fitting on batteries, whether it's sitting on a, a massive load of batteries is actually really good for you. Well, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on that. Lee Davey there, who is a vlogger. And thanks also to Jason, um, who's a trusted uh, listener who has uh, got in touch and said we had to talk to Lee. And, and uh, thanks also to the uh, guy on Twitter yesterday who said that it was absolutely imperative we talk more about electric vehicles. So I respond. I do I do what you, you want us to do because it's my show, but it's your show as well. On uh, Stephen Millings in Belfast has been in touch on this and says, I could drive my 20-year-old Ford, Ford Focus for another 20 years and still have a smaller carbon footprint than by Buying one new electric car, says uh, Stephen. Uh, on potholes as well, um, uh, Christine in Surrey says uh, the solution is to fill the millions of fill the potholes with the millions of ruined car tires. Now that is thinking outside the box, uh, Christine. That is a very very interesting uh, solution there. Uh, Adam, I'm afraid, just got in a little bit too late with his text, but he said I should have asked Lee about the weight of electric uh, cars in multi-storey car parks. Another issue that comes up. Um, well, listen, uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous, we've had um, Tech Up Dave has been on the trail of the Loch Ness Monster. There is um, a photograph, has apparently revealed, and I quote, compelling evidence of the mythical Loch Ness Monster after uh, apparently this person kept it a secret for five years but did not share, share them out of fear of public ridicule. So if you're listening on talk radio, now's the time to switch on the telly uh, to uh, Sky 522, Virgin Media 606, free of YouTube 37 or free sat 217 to see what are quote unquote compelling pictures of the Loch Ness Monster. We will see if this holds any water whatsoever with Tech Up Dave next here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was move another on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Adam's been in touch again and to say, hi, Peter, thanks for reading my text. They've also had problems with electric cars and underground car parks where there has been a fire. Uh, yes, I, I have read about that before, Adam. I just momentarily forgot it a minute ago. Dawn in Chelmsford says, Peter, the government has forced car manufacturers into producing electric cars. I recently got a new car and it was a struggle to actually even get a petrol car. Talk about state control, says Dawn in uh, Chelmsford. Well, we will talk more about electric cars and indeed about potholes, but uh, there has been uh, a lesser spotted um, large monster, and that is, of course, Tech Up Dave. No, the Loch Ness Monster, sorry. Oh. I, I know. Well, this is the demise of Cat of the Week, Dave. Yes. Uh, we haven't seen you in a couple no. of weeks, but you have still been loyally Tech Upping the show, and uh, well done again on, uh, on, on Cat of the Week and all the work you put into it. Thank and you. Of course, you'll be, uh, I'm sure you've been supping your cappuccinos out of your uh, limited edition Carly I, P mug. I have. It's it's very sought after. Well, that, that, that's it. I mean, literally. People have asked about where the Tech Op Dave one is, though. Oh, have they? Have they? Have they? You just referred to yourself in the third person. That's always worrying. Carly P would never do that. No. Um, OK, right. Uh, apparently there are compelling images as to where the Loch Ness Monster is. And I wanted to talk to Tech, Tech Up Dave about this because if there's anyone who can track down the Loch Ness Monster, it's him. Um, if you're watching on Talk TV, you can see the quote-unquote compelling images. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say they're not that compelling. What do you think, Dave? Well, this comes back to uh, a couple of about a year, ago, no, four or five years ago, when uh, Chai Kelly took some photographs in 2018. She was at the lock, taking photos and videos of her uh, husband and her daughter, and uh, suddenly noticed this thing appear on the water. Uh, she was m feared. She didn't want to release them because she thought. People are just going to People say, will think I'm... I've I'm, gone completely I'm, mad. Yes. But uh, she released them when they were doing uh, a big 50-year Nessie hunt. Right. <laughs> yes. Madness. And, uh, yeah, so she said that uh, about 200 metres from shore, uh, moving from left to right at a steady speed was this creature. It was spinning and rolling at times. We never saw a head or neck, and after a couple of minutes it just disappeared and we never saw it again. Um, Dawn has been in touch already on text say the Loch Ness Monster is just like all the big cats that are photographed. There's no definitive evidence is produced. Black leopards are very rare in the British countryside. I actually once said on air that I thought there were wolves in Britain. There apparently aren't any wolves oh. on the on Oops. the loose. I have a particular friend who keeps me going about this as often as she can, yes. uh, mentioning that I thought there were wolves. There aren't. Uh, I mean, Dave, are you convinced? Well, there have been ten sightings last year. Ten sightings Which of the makes alleged the total, sightings. And ma makes the total 1,156. And, <laughs> right. and the first sighting yes. goes back to the early 7th century. Right. When a uh, Irish monk who was staying with some ca companions went over to uh, the, the lock and right. found these guys 
uh, trying to bury a man that had been swimming in the river when he was attacked by a water beast that mauled him and dragged him underwater. Dis and despite their attempts to rescue him... <laughs> I mean, this is just nonsense. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, okay. I mean, you're, 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 we're now have people basically saying that the Loch Ness monster is 1,300 years old. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe it's another generation. It could, could be. Could be. Could be sort of great, great, great grandson of of Nessie or something. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there's another story that caught my eye this week. Uh, we'll move on from the yeah. fictional Moving Loch on. Ness monster, which actually did ha did happen, and this was the adorable moment that bears. Uh, this was sent in to me by a viewer by Natasha. He said that there were bears enjoying a ride on a pedaloo in a safari park. Yes, this was at Woburn uh, Park, uh, Woburn uh, Safari Park in Bedfordshire, um, in this large enclosure where they keep the bears. Uh, we've had quite a lot of rain recently, you may have noticed, and it f uh, part of it flooded. Right. So the keepers thought for a bit of a giggle, they'd put a pedalo in next to this large flooded lake that had formed <laughs> right. and, and wondered what was going to happen. Uh, so this anyway, was a swan sort of it was a swan, swan pedalo, format, which kind you of normally one sort of see pedalo with a sort of swan yeah. head. So, so the, the the bears were seen swanning around. Uh, yes, they were one by one. Uh, they came along uh, to investigate, Brilliant. and within a few minutes, all four seats were taken, and this thing was floating in the middle <laughs> of the pond. Brilliant, genius swan, but not forgotten. Uh, no. Much like Tech Up Dave. Uh, thank thank you. you very much indeed. We'll see you again uh, before too long. That was Tech Up Dave. Bring us up to date on some of the crazy stories that have uh, been happening. And uh, thank you to Marion County Down, who has been in touch on electric vehicles and says White Van Man won't buy an electric van as the range isn't good enough and they don't have the time to sit waiting for a charge station. Time is money for tradespeople. Very good point. Self-employed and small business owners who fuel a large chunk of the economy. In fact, 99% of the economy is uh, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, Dave, you have some thoughts on electric cars as well? Yes, well, it was just a quick one, really. I know the post office are trading in a lot of their vans and they've got loads of electric vans. So there. they have electric vans, but actually yes. and time is money for them as well, because well, they yes. need people to, 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 to deliver. And Mary actually continues in her message, I know a major local dealership with a large stock of unsold and unsellable electric vans. You yeah. just made the point about electric vans in the post office there. Um, the, uh, or, sorry, Royal Mail. An engineer friend, uh, Mary, says, often drives several hundred miles a day, usually racing from customer to customer. Electric vehicles are no use to him or most other tradespeople. I mean, that, that, is, that is fair enough, isn't it? Yeah, that's fair enough. But, I mean, I have seen there are quite a lot of electric vans. A lot of the courier companies now using them as well. So Yeah, a lot, a lot when of taxis when, are electric yeah. uh, vehicles as so. well, apparently. Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Dave, Ange has been in touch to say, uh, Peter, uh, MX5 girl here in my car, 17 years old us 80 miles a month uh, stick your electric uh, great show says Ange so uh, all sorts of things to do with cars whether they are electric cars or indeed the effects of cars on the weather on the road surfaces potholes have been a big one today and Robert in the West Midlands has been in touch on this 0344 499 1000 is the number Robert has rung you're very welcome to the program Robert what would you like to say on this thank you Peter good afternoon mate good afternoon um, hi well, would I be able to give a shout out to uh, my local council for this as well? <laughs> you can, of course. Uh, are you um, being are you being one hundred percent complimentary about them, Robert? It doesn't matter if you are or you're not. Well, it doesn't matter, does it really? Because I'm going to get told the story anyway. Um, Go for it. Well, it's, it's, it's Samwell Council in Dudley. Okay. Um, basically, we live on an A road, and for years now, there's been potholes everywhere in the road. You know, there's been n numerous accidents. And about three months ago, they, they closed the road and we got a sign up saying we're resurfacing. So everybody thought, oh, brilliant, you know, there's going to be a brand new Finally, road. we'll get it fixed. Yeah. Yeah. And um, everything was done, you know, they finished the work, thought, brilliant, there's going to be a brand new road there. <laughs> and Peter, they didn't fix the road, they fixed the footpaths. Oh, my word. They tore at the footpaths, man. And there's grass growing now on the, on the top. The That's new crazy. I, I mean, you would, you would have thought local council, come on here, guys, you know, you've got some pretty straightforward yeah. obligations to the public. Uh, I mean, it's not quite making the trains run on time, but it, it, it's close. It's getting the, 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 the surface of the road sorted out. Yeah. You know, let, let's just get it sorted. But local councils, really, Robert, they've been under a lot of financial pressure. And maybe they're just thinking, actually, we don't have the money to do it. I know, yeah, but right next to where they put the paths, the new, like, laid the new paths, there's huge potholes, man. <laughs> They're massive. 
<laughs> you could fall down one and get lost. <laughs> well, we don't want that. And, and you're a driver, Robert? Yes, I am, mate. Uh, yeah. Has your car been affected by them? Yeah, I've popped tyres, I've smashed my alloys a couple of times as well, like so. <laughs> but when they've when they done the road, we thought, brilliant, I'm going to, you know, fix fix the potholes, and they ended up doing the footpaths. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'll, I bet the complaints have gone back in. Uh, I, 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 I expect they have, Robert. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on that. That's Robert, Robert in the West Midlands there. Thanks also to Adrian in Gloucester, who has WhatsApp me, to say when police and ambulance go fully electric, they will require twice the number of vehicles. Not good for the environment. At the moment, a working shift ends and the next shift take over the vehicles. In future, a shift will end. They'll have to put the vehicle on charge for 68 hours and have to use an additional vehicle. That's a really good point, Adrian. Also, what happens if you're in a police chase and you run out of uh, electric? Uh, that's, that's another another thought on that one. Uh, well, Nick Dubois is here between one and four. Hello, Nick. How are you Hello. doing? Stop having a go electric cars. Do you have an electric car? I certainly do, yes. Are, are, aren't they just a bit rubbish? No, they're brilliant. And it only takes me 25 minutes to get a full charge of nearly 300 miles an hour if you're on a supercharger. So the police can have one of those. Oh, right. Okay. A supercharger only takes 25 minutes. Well, yeah. I'll tell you something. When I, I, I don't drive in London, but when I'm at home in Northern Ireland, I drive uh, the car belonging to my father's mystery female companion who cannot be named on, on uh, broadcast <laughs> uh, for fear fear of reprisal and she lends me her car and um, I, I go to the petrol station and fill it up in about two minutes. Yes, you probably do, but you see, I think I get better value, better price. I drive to Spain in it and it saves me a lot of money. How many times when, do you have to stop between uh, uh, here get, and Spain? I, I do six charges, which is for about 1,200 miles, which frankly you'd want to stop anyway to have a break with a long drive like that. And I have an overnight in that as well. So we weren't meant to talk about this. We were weren't, we? but you're an, something of an EV angelist, uh, <laughs> one, 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 one might say. My goodness, that's good. Uh, very Tell good me what's coming up in your programme between well, one and four, um, Nick. Uh, I want to ask, why? What, what do conspiracy theories say about society? One thing that's come more obvious since this uh, news about uh, Kate has become clear is the number of people who uh, are buying into all the conspiracy theories are out there. There's lots of que queries around it. I, I, I mean, it's not just true around Princess Kate as well. The, the other one is the Great Reset, which I'm often contacted about, which is another, and I would go perhaps less a conspiracy theory, but there's enough of a conspiracy theory in there when the evidence says this is just rubbish. So what is it? What does it say about society? Why, where is the cause? What's driving these? Is it a vacuum of information? Is it anti-establishment? I just want to dig into that um, and and indeed we'll be doing more of that as well mm -hmm. and we will be taking a little bit of look at the Nike flag thing but from a different point of view I want to ask compared to many countries Ireland being one of them I'm sure you would agree we seem embarrassed about our flag we don't put our flag out what is that what drives that is that just an embarrassment come to Northern Ireland British? not afraid of the flags there no. and go to see, Spain you'll see plenty all of over them. the place lots of places have them we don't we seem ashamed of it are we really ashamed it's of a really it? good a really good angle actually on the nike story which i i'm a bit you know slightly, yeah, slightly exactly. shrugging my shoulders up to be honest it, it's certainly not you know it's it doesn't deserve in many ways a lot of the attention but it does i mean even the church of england they they used to proudly put the um yeah. english flag up there you don't see it that much i was so i was particularly that. amused that by a complete coincidence i mean the person that that each each party uh but each political party sends out on the morning interviews, the morning rounds, and talking about the uh, flag of St George and the English flag. Who was it yesterday? Emily Thornbury. Oh, there uh, you so, go. You know, oh, oh, famous over in a by-election. Oh, well, indeed. Yeah, the, the, the white van. Um, Nick, thank you very much Pleasure. indeed. Nick uh, Dubois is here between one and four. Uh, thank you to Mark in Bristol. He says, I've been sending you God knows how many times uh, how many WhatsApp messages about Royal Mail and the electric vehicle problems. None has been read out. What's the point in joining in if every time you ignore mine you're fast becoming pointless? Mark, I'm very sorry. I am not in charge of... Uh, selecting the things that are read out. Um, so I'm going to blame the producer.